Hello everyone and welcome to game number 21 of the 1960 World Chess Championship match between Mikhail Tal and Mikhail Botvinnik. Now as you've seen in the, the previous game, uh, Botvinnik did, did have some uh, opportunities to continue the game, uh, but he decided to, to accept the draw offer and uh, decided to go into game 21. And here, uh, before the game started, the result is 12-8 to 8 in Tal's favor. So Tal is still 4 points in the lead and uh, all Tal needs to win this, win this entire match is to draw this game. And uh, if Botvinnik, uh, you know, uh, if Botvinnik was to actually uh, continue uh, the struggle, uh, he would have to win four games in a row to, to tie the score to be 12-12. And uh, Tal wasn't sure if, uh, you know, if uh, Botvinnik was going to do this, if Botvinnik had given up on the match, or was he really going to try and win four consecutive uh, games in a row. Uh, that's, uh, well, it's not a quote about the board, but it's, uh, it's one sentence from Tal's book. Uh, it was hard to convince myself that Botvinnik would play for a win in each of the four remaining games. So yeah, that basically what that means. And uh, yeah, Tal also didn't know if uh, Botvinnik maybe uh, maybe uh, drew the previous game uh, maybe too early to maybe get inside of Tal's head. Uh, so Tal would think that Botvinnik had given up on the match. So a lot of things to consider here. Everyone was already congratulating Tal and saying, hey, I mean, you just have to draw one more game uh, out of the four games. But uh, to Tal, he still had to play a nice game. Uh, so, uh, as this is the final game, uh, let's see some photos. Uh, here we have a nice photo uh, of the Pushkin Theater in Moscow. There are, are Tal and Botvinnik uh, playing there. Uh, you have two show, bo uh, sh show boards, uh, one on the left and one on the right, and the audience is uh, right here. But I, I also have one photo from the other side, so you can see that uh, there are actually multiple, uh, uh, multiple, uh, not layers of audience, but uh, multiple... Uh, like stairs yeah not stairs I don't know the word I'm looking for damn but it doesn't really matter uh, here is a nice close-up uh, this is maybe from the last round maybe not uh, I don't really know it's hard to say and uh, all of these um, uh, all of these photos are from uh, from a short clip uh, and the link to that clip will be in the description below so feel free to check it out uh, it's on a it's some on some British channel uh, I don't know if they have uh, like uh, like the the right to show uh, uh, this footage but it's there and uh, no, no one uh, no one's doing anything about it so so feel free to check it out I guess and I do have some more uh, but uh, we'll leave those for after the game so uh, let's see it uh, d4 Tal uh, decides to go d4 in this game he tried to find um, he tried to find an opening and a line in this opening that allows Botvinnik to go for a quiet opening. But also, uh, to, if Botvinnik decides to go for a sharp line, it, it can immediately uh, be seen and uh, dealt with. So, for the first time in this match, Tal opens with the d4 and we have knight to f6. c4, e6 and here, uh, Tal, Tal did want to play knight to c3. He wanted to see what uh, Botvinnik would, uh, if Botvinnik would go for the Queen's Indian, uh, not for the Queen's Indian, for the uh, Nimzo Indian defense and uh, how he would handle Tal's Semish attack. Uh, but he didn't, uh, in any other game he would have done this, but not in this one. He, th here he played knight to f3 uh, and uh, Botvinnik responded with b6. So the quiet Queen's Indian defense and Tal was actually very happy to, s to see this. So g3. Uh, continuing in a similar uh, similar fashion, I'm uh, going to counter Botanix b7, bishop with a g2 bishop, so bishop to b7, bishop to g2, and now bishop to e7. Tal castles, Botanix castles, knight to c3, and now knight to e4. Uh, queen c2, uh, with a double attack on the knight, knight captures, queen captures, and f5. And uh, this was a well-known theoretical uh, position at the time, and uh, here Tal played b3. Uh, if he really wanted to go for an uh, for, for an edge to gain an, any kind of an advantage, and if he was playing any other game but this one, uh, he would have gone for d5, which would uh, which would promise a, a complicated and sharp game. Uh, but here uh, he prefers uh, a calm uh, continuation. He plays b3, preparing to develop the bishop. Uh, bishop to f6. Now comes bishop to b2, and now d6. Uh, rook a to d1. Uh, queen to e7 and now knight to e1. Uh, we have bishop captures on g2, so Tal offered the trade of bishops, and of course Botvinnik, uh, there really isn't a better move than simply accepting the bishop. Uh, we have knight captures and now knight to c6. Uh, queen to f3, attacking the knight on c6, and queen to d7, defending it. Uh, knight to f4. Now Tal is threatening knight captures on e6. Uh, of course, if queen captures, then queen captures on c6 is a threat. So uh, rook a to e8, defending the d6 pawn, 
and uh, here uh, Tal did uh, think about this position for a while and he decided that it was a perfectly safe position for him and if uh, he didn't really know what to play e3 that's definitely a move but what is e3 doing I mean probably nothing so he decided to play d5 uh, with with uh, the following idea he wanted uh, bishop captures on b2 uh, and uh, e d captures on e6 with an attack on the queen and now of course uh, if you move the queen then queen captures on c6 you win back the piece but the real idea is knight to e5 attacking tal's queen so after pawn captures knight captures with check uh, we have pawn captures and now rook to e7 here tal's idea was b4 so after black recaptures the pawn on d7 to play uh, b5 and now uh, this b pawn would be uh, preventing uh, this a pawn from coming forward and also uh, keeping this uh, weak c7 pawn at bay so uh, this was kind of Tal's idea when he pushed d5 and uh, this is what he expected uh, he didn't really find any any other other good moves for black uh, but uh, Botvinnik, uh, Botvinnik played the absolute strongest move and he played a move that Tal definitely didn't expect uh, the move is knight to d8, but the reason Tal didn't expect it is because here after knight to d8 uh, on move 17, Botvinnik actually offered Tal a draw. So Botvinnik in fact had given up on the championship and he decided there was really no way to try and win four, con uh, you know, four consecutive games in a row. Uh, so knight to d8, move 17, uh, a draw offer and Tal happily accepted this offer. So by this move and here, uh, I even, I, I wanted to prepare some nice uh, last words by Tal himself from his book uh, but unfortunately these are Tal's last words from the book as you can see knight c6 to d8 so this is the move uh, and it says uh, well and made me a flattering offer so it says Botvinnik prior to this uh, made me a flattering offer Botvinnik's 17th move was destined to be the last move in this match and this is the last sentence in the book I thought there would be something like after that you know Tal talking about something but uh, there really isn't. Maybe maybe in a Russian version, maybe this is just a bad translation, who knows. If anyone uh, read the Russian version, uh, you know, maybe there really is something that we could add here. Uh, but yeah, uh, that's basically it. And uh, so out of, out of 21 games, uh, the Tal won the match with 12.5 to 8.5. So with a four-point lead, uh, that's, uh, I mean, that's, that's a very nice uh, result to, to win the World Chess Championship. And uh, here we do have a couple more photos. Uh, here is uh, the crowd from the other angle. Uh, so you can see uh, down there. And uh, also also there are some people upstairs. Uh, all of them are uh, applauding uh, Tal now for winning the World Chess Championship title. And here we have Tal uh, ready to receive his prize. And also here another photo of him uh, receiving it and uh, being, being congratulated officially. So there aren't, uh, there aren't that many photos or... or uh, video footage of this event but there are some on the internet so feel free to look for them uh, like i said I, I i will put a link uh, with a short clip uh, about uh, you know it, it's a very short clip in russian uh, where they show tal and botvinnik and tal winning the championship so feel free to check it out and uh, yeah feel free to check out uh, all, all of the games from this world chess championship all 21 of them and uh, uh, once again, I will invite you to check out my coverage of the 1959 Candidates Tournament, the tournament Tal had to win uh, to actually get this opportunity to face Mikhail Botvinnik. And now, uh, at the end of this video, I, I realized that uh, I left the photos. <laughs> yeah, uh, I actually left the photos. Uh, Tal is, Tal is uh, up there and Botvinnik is down there, but uh, okay, I will edit this out maybe. Uh, yeah, I, as this is the la uh, the last video, I, I will edit this and then upload it. So, uh, totally, completely disregard this last sentence I said. So yeah, uh, that's the game. I do hope you enjoyed it. I do hope you enjoyed uh, my entire coverage of this match. So now you have all of the 21 games. You know, you're free to do whatever you want with them. You can download them. You can burn them to a CD. Uh, well, not a CD. It won't fit on a CD. But maybe on a Blu-ray it will. And, you know, <clears throat> you can give it to your grandpa. Uh, so he can also check it out, you know, it'd be nice for him to remember the good old days. So yeah, uh, I would like to thank uh, Athanasios Makris and uh, Richard Gruis for a contribution to my channel. Thank you a lot, I really appreciate it. Uh, as usual, you can check two of my previous videos here. Thank you all for watching, uh, and I will see you soon, uh, probably with uh, one of your suggestions, as it's been a while since I uh, did any of your suggestions. I was too busy with the candidates, then with the Grand Chess Classic, uh, and then with covering this match. So uh, for 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 some time now, I will be. 
uh, mostly doing suggestions and some, uh, you know, uh, isolated incidents in the chess world. Uh, and then probably I will return to some other series. Uh, you know, there are a lot of great uh, world chess championships uh, that were played. And there are a lot of great candidates tournaments uh, that were played and tournaments in general. So, yeah. Uh, once again, thank you uh, for, you know, uh, enjoying and increasing your vast knowledge of the 1960 uh, World Chess Championship match between Mikhail Tal and Mikhail Botvinnik. Thank you all and I will see you soon. Hello everyone and welcome to a very nice miniature that was played in 1981 in the Mexico City World Junior Chess Championship. It's played between Ognin Svitan uh, with the white pieces and Nigel Short. And uh, okay, I couldn't find a photo of Ognin Svitan when he was younger, but uh, I do have uh, a couple of photos here. I have one from 1992. Uh, that where he's uh, where he's definitely younger, and I do have one from 1979. So uh, he's the guy on the far left. So two years even before this game was played, but it's of uh, uh, really poor quality. So I decided to use uh, this one as it's uh, much nicer, even though he's older in this photo. But regardless. Uh, now about the the match yesterday. It was a it was a very nice game, and uh, uh, after that uh, first goal that England scored, that was a that was a monster goal. When I saw that free kick, uh, I was like, that is that is very impressive. And uh, then Croatia managed to equalize, which uh, I have no idea how that ball connected with his foot. It was like uh, Perisic, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, kicked the ball with with his toe. Uh, but uh, regardless, you know, it's uh, it was an equalizer, and then uh, Manjukic uh, went for uh, for two one. Uh, and then Croatia was able to keep the score uh, all the way to the end. And uh, I read somewhere that uh, Manjukic spent like four thousand dollars to buy to buy beers uh, for uh, for for Croatia fans uh, uh, in Russia. And that is a lot of beer. Uh, but yeah, uh, Croatia now uh, qualified for the finals of the World Cup, and it it seems fitting that you know if you want to become world champion, you have to you have to be able to overcome the French defense. So we'll uh, talk about that a bit more on Sunday, but now let's uh, get back to this game. So it's Ognjen Svitan with the white pieces against Nigel Short. Uh, we have d4, knight to f6, c4, e6, and knight to f3. So avoiding uh, the Nimzo Indian with knight to c3, so basically this is the anti-Nimzo. Uh, just, just a second. So knight to f3, uh, b6, and now uh, a3. This is the Petrosian variation uh, of the Queen's Indian defense, uh, not uh, not allowing something like knight to c3, where black can even transpose back into the Queen's Indian defense uh, with bishop to b4, and then here b black is basically the one that that chooses what to play. Uh, here Tsvitan goes for a3. Uh, we have c5 now, and now d5. Uh, further expanding in the center, grabbing more space. Uh, bishop to a6, attacking the c4 pawn, and uh, Tsvitan defends it with queen to c2. Uh, we have pawn captures, pawn captures, and now bishop back to b7. This is a standard idea in the Queen's Indian defense. Uh, why, uh, you might ask yourself, why not keep the bishop here? You know, it seems like this is a very nice pin. If white ever moves the, uh, the pawn, then you can capture on f1. Uh, well, even if you do something like this, let's see. Uh, let's say you just keep on developing. Uh, White will gladly go e4, and after you capture, okay, king f1. Uh, you did mess up his uh, uh, castling privileges, but after Black continues developing, simply g3, uh, king g2 is coming. The rook is coming into the game. Uh, White has a very nice center, and uh, all is well here. So nothing really, nothing really for Black here. You know, you only mess up uh, uh, White's uh, castling privileges for for a bit, and then White will be able to castle artificially anyways. So Bishop back to b7. We have e4 now. Queen to e7, uh, attacking the e4 pawn twice, but also uh, now the e4, the e4 pawn is pinned. The knight captures on d5 is a threat. Threat. Uh, so here we have uh, a very nice pawn sacrifice by Tsvitan. Bishop to d3. And okay, knight captures on d5, uh, Tsvitan castles, now the knight is under attack as the pawn is no longer pinned, and now the a3 pawn really comes in uh, very handy as now knight to b4 is impossible. Uh, we have knight back to c7 and knight to c3. So okay, for the price of one pawn, uh, Tsvitan really uh, gets a lot of development and uh, Nigel really has to figure out how to go from here. Uh, queen back to d8. You don't want to allow knight to d5 uh, with an attack on the queen and uh, of course black never wants to uh, capture on d5 and allow e captures on d5 to, to be able, so white will be able to play rook e1 and open up this queen bishop battery. Uh, so queen back to d8, and now comes knight to d5. Uh, we have knight to e6, avoiding the exchange, and here, uh, 
Nigel is still up a pawn, and if he will be able to defend, okay, then maybe he will be able to counter White's initiative. And here you could definitely go for some development, rook e1, maybe b3, prepare bishop b2. Uh, but here Tsvitan goes knight to e5, which is basically looking for adventure. Uh, we have knight to c6, and now comes f4. Knight captures on e5, f captures on e5, and bishop to e7. Uh, queen to e2. And here, Nigel really has to figure out what to do. Uh, so, uh, the basic question is, can Black Castle here? Well, he can, but it's uh, it's not all that easy to make this decision. Uh, if you castle here, then uh, White immediately jumps in with Queen to h5. Then Knight to f6 is a big threat. Uh, so, if you decide to play something like Bishop captures on d5, then comes Pawn captures. Uh, immediately you free the bishop, queen captures on h7 is a big threat. Uh, after g6, queen moves, and now you do have to do something about your knight here. And there is really not all that much you can do. If you move the knight, then d6 comes, you're losing the bishop uh, on e7 after bishop h4 and g3. Uh, the bishop is trapped, and uh, white wins the game here. And on the other hand, after queen to h5, if you don't capture the knight here, if you try something like, let's say, king h8, uh, then comes knight to f6, never, you know, regardless. Uh, captures, captures attacking the bishop, and here it's uh, again not all that uh, clear what the black can do here to defend. Uh, if you capture, then e5 wins the game immediately, as queen captures on h7 is a threat, and there's really no good way to, to prevent this. Uh, like, no, no way whatsoever. Even if you block with the knight, the bishop captures, knight is coming, so this is only prolonging the inevitable. So, although uh, it, it is possible to castle here and defend, but, you know, in, in a practical game, it's very unlikely that black would actually castle here. So here, Nigel Short goes for h6. Uh, Tsvitan immediately jumps in, queen to h5, uh, and now comes rook to f8. So, okay, uh, Nigel decided he will not be castling kingside this game. Uh, he has to protect the f7 pawn. Uh, and here, uh, okay, there are a lot of possible ideas here, but Tsvitan goes for the most active one. Bishop captures on h6. Uh, not really interested in that pawn. What Tsvitan is interested in is uh, connecting rooks as soon as possible, getting that bishop out of the way, and then rook captures on f7 is a threat, and then the other rook can come uh, and assume this uh, f1 square instead of this rook. So this is the plan, and black really doesn't have all that much choice. Black has to capture the bishop. G captures on h h6 was played, and now comes rook captures on f7. Uh, you have to capture the rook, or else uh, you're getting checkmated after uh, a simple discovery is made. So rook captures, and now comes a rook to f1. So this is the idea, attacking the pin piece. Rook on f7 is attack, queen captures on f7 is the threat of checkmate. Uh, knight to g5, the knight is defending the rook on f7, this is the only good move, and uh, the only move that uh, allows black to keep on defending. Uh, here, bishop to c4, introducing another attacker. As the bishop on d3 isn't doing all that much, bishop to c4, introducing another attacker into, into this story. And here, uh, it's a very unpleasant position for black, definitely. But uh, black can yet to defend. So here, I want you to pause the video here and try to find a way black could have defended this position. So I will get a, give it a couple of seconds if you want to give it a shot. Uh, for those of you who were able to do it, if you found bishop captures uh, on d5, that's that's uh, that's all right. But uh, there is an even better move, that is queen to b8. If you found queen to b8, then you are definitely an excellent defender, and I congratulate you, uh, because now the idea is after queen cap, after rook captures, knight captures, and this knight to f6 check, now opening up a double attack from the queen uh, and the bishop. Uh, king to d8, and now queen captures on f7. And now black has a choice. Uh, either you found uh, bishop captures, which leads to a forced draw after a repetition of moves here, uh, or you have found after queen captures on f7 this bishop to c6 move, uh, but that's uh, not all that easy to do. Give up yet another piece. After queen checks, king moves, uh, you capture the bishop, but then queen to f8 comes, and after you move the queen, uh, black introduces uh, his rook into the game, and now black is up the exchange and is able to play this game. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's not an easy move to find. Queen to b8, Nigel didn't find it, and he didn't play uh, pawn, uh, bishop captures. Uh, rather, he played king to f8. He decided, uh, I'm, I'm going to unpin, so now white is forced to capture, uh, but he missed uh, one move uh, by Tsvitan. So, uh, here, pause the video and uh, find uh, the attacking idea that uh, that Nigel missed in this position. Uh, I will give it a couple of seconds if you want to, you know, give it a shot. Uh, 
Uh, for those of you who were able to do it, uh, I congratulate you, you are an excellent attacker, and for those of you who just want to enjoy the show, Tsvitna played rook captures on f7, knight captures on f7, uh, and here the move you had to find, knight to f6. Knight to f6, after Nigel saw this, uh, he resigned the game, and a great victory for uh, uh, for the Croatian player Ognjen Cvitan. Uh, why did he resign? Well, of course, queen captures on f7 is the threat of checkmate. There's no real good way to defend the knight. Uh, you can give up some material, but that's only saving you temporarily, uh, you know, prolonging the inevitable, even queen, d queen, queen e8, giving up uh, the queen as the knight is guarding here. Uh, so there's really nothing to do here. Uh, you could try something like knight to h8, but then again, okay, now the knight is guarding f7, but now queen captures on h6 is checkmate, uh, as the bishop is uh, slicing all the way here, and the knight is guarding e8, as we said. And trying something like d5, again, only prolonging the inevitable, simply pawn captures on passant, and again, the idea is completely the same. So after this knight to f6 move, uh, Nigel resigned the game and a very nice victory for Ognjen Cvitan who in 1981 uh, won the World Junior Chess Championship in Mexico City. So yeah, uh, Croatia will also have a chance on Sunday to become uh, World Cup winners but in order to do that they will have to uh, overcome the French defense. So yeah, uh, that's the game. I do hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Christian Stork, uh, Alan Asbury, Danny McCullough, uh, Dagoberto Gonzalez, and Matthew Sperling for a contribution to my channel. Thank you a lot. I really appreciate it. Uh, as usual, you can check two of my previous videos here. Thank you all for watching, and uh, I will see you soon uh, with another interesting video. Thank you all. Hello everyone and welcome back to the Candidates Tournament, it's round 14, the penultimate round and it's Alexander Grishuk versus Anish Giri and this is the game that could potentially give us the challenger of Magnus Carlsen in November, uh, as Giri now absolutely must win, if he doesn't then uh, Yanni Pomnici is the challenger since you've already seen the previous video, so let's see how he does, he has the black pieces and he needs a win in this round and uh, hopefully in next one as well. So Grishuk has the white pieces and he opens with d4. We have knight to f6 by Giri, c4, we have uh, e6, knight to f3, and now you could play a lot of different ideas here, but Giri goes for b6. He goes for the queen's Indian defense, uh, and this is something that we mentioned ever since alpha 0 completely destroyed the uh, queen's Indian defense that... Um, uh, it's probably not playable on that level, but for humans, you know, if you prepare something uh, for your opponent, then uh, it seems to be playable. And this is, uh, of course, why Giri uses it in the Candidates tournament. So here uh, we have g3, preparing to counter Black's light square bishop with bishop to g2. Uh, both players fianchetto their light square bishops, uh, and now bishop to b4 with check. Uh, bishop to d2 and now c5. So nothing new here, this has all been played before. Uh, we have bishop captures, c captures, doubling uh, the b pawn, uh, but you will play a, uh, a5 in the future, maybe even a4, and those pawns could be very strong. So here we have castles by both players, castles, castles, and now knight b to d2. Uh, nicely continuing development, black does the same, we have d6, uh, queen to b3 now attacking the pawn, and this is what we had in mind, a5, so this is what Giri plays, we have a3 trying to undermine that pawn, and now knight to a6, point being that if now captures, knight can capture, and this is now... Uh, well, a wonderful position for black, you have a very nicely placed knight on b4, and white doesn't really have all that much to show for. So instead of capturing here, of course, uh, uh, Sasha just continues developing, we have rook f to d1, uh, and now queen to e7, developing the queen, connecting the rooks, and now knight to e1, uh, offering a trade of light square bishops, uh, which Giri goes for, we have bishop captures, and here's a very interesting... Uh, a moment in the game where uh, Grishu can capture with the king but also with the knight. Uh, he captured with the king and capturing the ki with the king is a completely new move in this position and it's very interesting because there are I think around 17 games that reach this exact same position and one of the more notable ones uh, is uh, from the uh, Max Uwe Memorial in 1987. Anatoly Karpov, world champion Anatoly Karpov had this position against Viktor Korchnoi uh, and he also uh, captured with the knight and he won that game very nicely and very quickly I think in some uh, 15 moves after capturing this bishop. Uh, but uh, Grishuk probably knows about that game and about the other games as well, and probably why he decided to play king captures, maybe to avoid uh, Anisha's uh, preparation regarding this matter. So king captures on g2, already a completely new game uh, as of move 14. 
So here we have h5, uh, in the future you, you can play something like h4, maybe try and bust open the position here, knight to c2, uh, and now comes b captures on a3. We have b captures on a3, and now rook a to b8. So defending the b5, uh, the b6 pawn, uh, we have e4 grabbing more space in the center, and now Giri strikes in the center with e5. Uh, we have queen to d3 defending the d4 pawn, and now knight to c7. Shifting the knight over to e6, we have rook a to b1, uh, and now knight to e6 as planned. Putting more pressure uh, on the d4 pawn, uh, and now rook to b5. So that's a very nicely placed rook there, putting more pressure on the e5 pawn. Also at some point you might even consider rook d to b1, putting more pressure on the b6 pawn. Here we have rook f to e8 by Giri, and now comes h4. Uh, just uh, solidifying on the king side, Giri plays g6, and now even f3, and this is a uh uh, seemingly a weakening of the position, but not really as uh, it's not really that kind of a position where black can just, you know, uh, sacrifice something and attack the pawn is just uh, improving white's uh, uh, situation here in the center. So here uh, we have knight back to d7 by Anish and now knight to f1, shifting that knight over to e3. Uh, we have captures on d4, Giri breaks the tension in the center, knight captures and now knight to e5. And now uh, the queen is under attack, so queen back to e2. And and now knight captures on d4. We have rook captures and knight to c6. Now chasing away the rook, and uh, you have done you have done some progress here, but white's position is still uh, a, a little bit better. The the pieces are more active. Okay, this knight not doing all that great now, but he can come to e3, for example, to d5 very easy, uh, easily, and it, or maybe e3, maybe g4 is an idea also in the future. So here rook back to d1, and now queen to e6. So what do you play here? Uh, knight to e3 as planned. This knight is now a, a wonderful piece here. Uh, and here Giri played knight to e7. And this move will come back to haunt him, I believe, for a very long time. Uh, it's it's a hard position uh, for black, definitely. But knight to e5 seems to be uh, the most resilient idea. Although even this isn't all that great. Uh, because we're just going to double here on, on the d file. Go after this d6 pawn. And after, let's say, rook b to d8. Defending this pawn, we're going to play queen to d2. Now with a triple attack here. And it's just a bad position for black. There's no way to defend this. Uh, if you try something like queen d7, it uh, doesn't really matter. We're just going to capture, queen captures, rook captures, queen captures, rook captures, rook captures. And now if rook to c8 uh, with a double attack on the rook here, we don't trade with rook captures. We go back and then we just play this position. We're up a pawn and, you know, we're just going to bring the king closer to the action, push, push back the knight and just uh, enjoy a superior game. So this is probably the best Giri has, uh, but he wanted more. He played knight to e7, uh, controls the f5 square, now wants to, wants to push f5, uh, but this doesn't really wor work all that great for him. So if you want to uh, figure out what Grishuk played here, uh, feel free to pause the video and try to find, uh, well, a reasonable move here for white wh while I give you a couple of seconds. So uh, for those of you who were able to do it, congratulations on finding uh, either queen to d2 or queen to b2. Both are very nice moves, just going after those pawns. Uh, Grishuk played queen to d2, and now you have serious problems here, because you can't defend this uh, pawn with the rook, or, uh, because this pawn falls, and if you defend it with this rook, uh, then we start attacking with the g4 and this is the problem constantly for black uh, captures is a threat here because the rook also covers that uh, uh, h5 square so black simply cannot allow this if you play something like knight to c6 we're just going to capture trade everything off captures move the king bring the rook to g1 the queen has a very clear axis the knight can come to f5 uh, i'm sure there's like a 10 different ways you, you can win this position so instead after this g4 move we would have to play something like h captures which is just bad because you allow knight captures and then uh, a lot of different ideas become possible the knight and the queen both uh, control the h6 square you can play h5 then you can maybe play knight h6 check uh, you could bring the rook very easily into the game if the position opens up. So this would just be winning for white and uh, no doubt uh, Sasha would have uh, very little problems um, 
uh, converting this. So instead, after queen to d2, Anish tried f5, as this was the plan, and now comes uh, queen captures on d6. There is no point in waiting with this, and you don't want to capture with the queen, because rook captures, and then you lose this pawn as well. If you try defending, the, uh, then you no longer defend the g6 pawn. So that's a pretty big uh, issue. So after this, we have knight to c6, and then uh, comes e captures on f5. And this is a really a wonderful move, because if the knight is captured, then of course queen captures on g6, and black's entire position falls apart, and the white king is perfectly safe here. For example, if king to h8, we just play f6, and that's it. We either deliver checkmate, or you can try something, but not much. If this, uh, okay, uh, for example, if rook to g8, you don't have queen to h6, because the queen covers that, but there's still the rook. I know you forgot about this rook for the second time now, but rook captures on h5 does exist, and that's it. Queen h6, this is just checkmate, or queen captures, doesn't really matter. So instead, after e captures on f5, we have g captures. The knight for the moment cannot be uh, captured, and the only now queen captures on e6. Eliminate the defender of the f5 pawn, rook captures, and now knight captures on f5. And now you're simply up two pawns, and this is simply too much, uh, especially in a classical game, uh, and, uh, well... Uh, not, not much can be done here. Giri played knight to e5. He will, of course, uh, fight on. Uh, the c4 pawn is under attack, but now rook to d6. Attacking the, the rook here. Uh, we have rook back to e8. If you trade, then knight captures, defends the pawn here. So, of course, black cannot afford any more trades. Uh, we have rook back to e8, and now rook to d4. Just nicely defending that. Also, you have support for uh, g4 uh, at any time. So knight to c6, attacking the rook, rook back to d2 now, not allowing any rook to e2 lifts. So here uh, we have rook b to d8, uh, offering a trade here, and uh, Sasha very happily uh, obliges. Rook captures, rook captures, and now uh, we don't go rook, uh, rook captures pawn, because then you allow some rook d2 check, and then maybe rook d3 with some attacks here. It's all lost for black, but you don't want to give him any chances. So here rook d5, and now comes rook capture on d5 c captures we have knight to e5 and now knight to d6 uh, we have king to f8 and uh, it was um, uh, in in this moment that both players have reached time control so you know time is no longer an issue in this game i don't think it ever was i think giri was maybe playing a bit faster to, to make uh, uh, sasha lose more time quickly uh, but uh, if that was the case it didn't work out all that well so king to f2 uh, grishuk starts bringing the king into the game king e7 attacks the knight, knight b5, and now king to f6. We have king e3, uh, the pawns are just too, too, too many in number. Uh, we have king to f5, now knight d6 check. King back to f6, king to e4 now. You cannot uh, you know, prevent the white king from uh, going forward. Knight d7, now king to d4. We have king to e7, now knight to b5. All of these squares are nicely covered, so the black king can't really enter the game from here. Uh, king to f6, and now knight to c3. So what do, you, what do you do now? Not much you can. We have king to f5, now knight to e4. And again, really no moves here for, for black. Uh, king to g6 was played, but now g4. Uh, we have b5 trying to create maybe a pass pawn, maybe with captures and a4. Maybe, maybe it's possible in some crazy universe. But here, uh, Sasha just played knight to c5, and he was in this position. Uh, unmove 51 that uh, Anish Giri resigned the game. And uh, a victory for Alexander Grishuk, which... Um, uh, goes a long way because uh, this means that uh, one whole round before the, the, the candidates end, uh, Yanni Polnishi is the challenger to Magnus Carlsen in November. So yes, we do have a challenger. Magnus will be playing against Yanni Polnishi, and that's uh, well, that's simply. Uh, I, I think it's going to be an amazing match. Uh, oh, it, it would be an amazing match whoever won the candidates tournament, but uh, specifically because of uh, Nepo's uh, you know weird weird style of play, I think it's going to be. Uh, the, the the craziest one uh, perhaps so here basically you resign because after you play anything let's say captures captures you can't trade because I mean you're down two pawns so you'd have to go back knight b8 or knight f8 doesn't really matter then comes d6 and that's it the pawn is just winning this is uh, this square is covered if you try and uh, help out with the king d7 king here now we start pushing this pawn you can you simply cannot stop uh, all of them so yeah, Giri tried, uh, he, it didn't work out, and you know, uh, all of a sudden he was down two pawns, and you know, it was just over. 
Uh, so yeah, tough break for Giri. He had his chance, uh, but uh, you know that's why the candidates tournament is the candidates tournament. You have to be the best, uh, and you know even though you you could be the best for the entire year, and then you play the candidates tournament, and then you just have a terrible tournament, like for example what happened to Ding Liren. Uh, but you know. It, 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 that's kind of the point of the candidates tournament and Nepo was definitely the best here and uh, you know he won the candidates uh, one whole round before the tournament ended which uh, I can't recall if it happened I don't know if you guys remember last time uh, in the candidates uh, when Magnus was playing in 2013 it wasn't up until the, the, the very last game that he knew that he was gonna you know uh, be the challenger to, to, to Vishwanathan Anand uh, but yeah also one very interesting thing if you guys are interested um uh, and Nepo is, uh, well, the only top 10 or maybe even the top 12, uh, 20 player or maybe even the top 100 player that has a positive score against Magnus Carlsen in classical time format. I think, uh, I could be wrong here, but I think Nepo defeated Magnus four times in classical chess and Magnus only defeated Nepo once or maybe twice. I don't know, stopped counting after a while, but he is one of the, uh, I, I don't think he's the only person uh, to have a, positive score against Magnus in classical as someone also mentioned this on Twitter but I think out of the the, the top 100 I think he is the the only person but not only that uh, uh, Yanni Pomnici also has a positive score against uh, Vishwanathan Anand against uh, Vladimir Kramnik uh, against Gary Kasparov uh, and against Anatoly Karpov okay against Kasparov and Karpov those were not classical games those were rapid games uh, but interestingly against a lot of uh, you know famous world champions uh, Nepo has a positive score so we'll see what happens in November slash December it's going to be really awesome and we will of course cover the last round of the tournament even though it no longer affects the results uh, so yeah, uh, that's the game. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, I would like to thank Matthew Benoit, Brad Rice, Rahul Karnat, Tiberiu, and Craig Wall for a contribution to my channel. Thank you a lot. I really appreciate it. Uh, as usual, you can check two of my previous videos here. Thank you all for watching, and I will see you soon. Continuing the coverage of the candidates, checking up on your wonderful suggestions, and whatever else happens uh, in the chess world. Thank you all. I will see you soon, and have an excellent rest of your day. Hello everyone and welcome to a wonderful game that comes as a suggestion from a subscriber. Uh, it is from 2005 from the European Championship. We just covered the European Championship, it ended uh, uh, two days ago, but uh, this is from European Championship 2005. Uh, Magnus pretty much just got his Grandmaster title, he got it uh, in 2004 and uh, he's facing Russian Grandmaster Alexander Ryazantsev, who's uh, been a Grandmaster since 2001, I believe. Uh, Magnus is 15, uh, when, when this was played, Ryazantsev is uh, around 19 and it's a really really awesome game uh, where uh, Alexander puts uh, a whole lot of pressure uh, <laughs> on Magnus uh, but Magnus somehow finds these uh, uh, incredibly ridiculous uh, complicated moves and he he just comes up on top so it's a really fun game uh, you guys will enjoy it let's check it out uh, here we have a d4 by Alexandra and Magnus goes uh, for the Queen's Indian defense and then knight to f6 is not the Queen's Indian defense but he will go for it e6 knight to f3 and now b6 the Queen's Indian defense. We have pawn to a3, uh, the second most popular option against uh, the, the Queen's Indian, and bishop to b7. We have knight to c3, d5. We have captures, captures, and now uh, bish uh, captures, captures, bishop to d2, and now bishop to e7. So all very standard stuff, even by today's standards. We have queen to c2, knight to d7, and now pawn to e4, chasing away Magnus's knight. So he trades on c3. Captures, captures with the bishop. We have castles and now rook to d1. We have rook to c8 by Magnus and now we have bishop to c4. Uh, you you might think, why not bishop to d3? Isn't that um, a better idea? Uh, the problem is c5. Uh, that's, uh, th that's why bishop to c4 is played first. Now after bishop to c4, you don't really have c5 as black. If you try c5 now, then d5 happens and bishop gives additional support to the d5 square. So that's why the weird move order. Bishop to c c4 we have knight to f6 by magnus now putting pressure on the e4 pawn and only now bishop back to d3 and now magnus strikes with c5 against the center d captures on c5 now you have to be a little bit careful as the rook is nicely aligned with the queen but magnus boldly captures on c5 with the rook there are no good discoveries for this bishop for the moment so here we have castles and now queen to a8 getting the queen out of harm's way and also uh, creating this powerful battery along this diagonal. We have rook f to e1, 
Uh, and now there is a game that was played in um, uh, 1996. It was played between Vladimir Akopian and uh, Vasil Ivanchuk, uh, where Rook to d8 was played. That game ended in a draw. But here Magnus played Rook f to c8, and it is now as of move 16 that we have a completely new game. So let's see how it continues. Of course, you have to move the queen from the c file, queen to e2, and now rook back to c7. If this was played by, um, let's say, Maxim Vashiel Lagrade, then no doubt we would see something like captures, captures, and captures. Uh, also, the a3 pawn would be weak, and you would have to connect the pass pawns on the queen side, which is uh, de definitely a good idea. But also, maybe just a4, and then bishop b5. It's hard to say if you will be able to um, uh, claim this pawn. So Magnus decides to go back, rook 5 to c7, and now pawn to a four you don't want to allow such a thing in the future pawn a6 we have knight to e5 and now bishop to f8 now you can see that the bishop pair is uh, very nicely placed uh, we have knight to c4 puts pressure on the b6 pawn and this will win the material so magnus needs to defend the b6 pawn knight to d7 was played now queen e3 piling up on the b6 pawn uh, rook to c6 defending and now bishop back to f1 this opens up uh, an attack from the rook to the knight on d7 knight to c5 and now pawn to a5 uh, again uh, putting pressure on that b6 pawn so magnus has to capture b captures on a5 and now knight captures on a5 rook has to move so rook back to c7 and now bishop to e5 again puts pressure on magnus's rook rook to d7 and now the mighty b4 and here uh, it's very hard to decide what to do with white. Magnus first trades a pair of rooks. Rook captures on d1. Rook captures. And now uh, the safest way to play this is knight to a4. But it's such a weird move to play. Magnus decides to play pawn to f6. Uh, and now bishop to f4. Uh, here you could uh, you could gain some advantage with b captures on c5. And then after Magnus captures, play this a very annoying bishop c4 move. Uh, it's not easy to defend the e6 pawn. Uh, you, uh, Black, Black will constantly have to worry about the, the past c pawn also the rook is coming to d7 so it would be it would be very very hard to defend this but the magnus was able to trick him he played pawn to f6 bishop back to f4 and now knight captures on e4 still rook to d7 puts pressure on the bishop on b7 uh rook to c3 attacks alexander's queen on e3 we have queen to e1 and again what is Magnus doing here? F3 is coming. This will remove the defender of the rook. How will how will he defend this? And also the bishop is still hanging. And Magnus here plays bishop to d5. He allows pawn to f3. And this is what he had in mind. Pawn to f3. Now comes bishop captures on b4. Uh, not just attacking the knight, but also threatening some very nasty discoveries here. Uh, but Alexander plays it precisely. F captures on e4, uh, and now bishop captures on e4. Notice that if you capture on a5, yes, you still kind of have some nasty discoveries, but after captures on d5, uh, there's just no good move here. For example, e5, bishop to d2, and all of black's counterplay is gone. This is just completely winning for white. So Magnus plays bishop captures on e4, uh, and now bishop to d2. Now, now what do you play here? Magnus plays bishop to c5 with check. Uh, he uses all of this to uh, align his bishops perfectly in a, in a, a very deadly fashion. King to h1, and now look at Magnus's next move. He plays rook to f3, and it's a weird move, but also you, you can feel that it's a powerful move. Uh, the problem is his position is lost, uh, but only if white finds uh, uh, a very particular move, basically the only move that wins him the game, otherwise he's just worse. So feel free to pause the video and try to find the winning idea for Alexander while I give you a couple of seconds. So uh, for those of you who were able to do it, congratulations on spotting this uh, weird move. And for those of you who just want to enjoy the show, it is a move with the knight back. Knight back to b7. Uh, it wasn't played in the game, uh, but this would uh, make things uh, or life very difficult for Magnus. Because now, not only is the rook hanging, also the bishop is hanging because the queen isn't defending the bishop. So what could you play here? Only move is bishop captures on b7. And now comes the really hard move to find. The first move was kind of easy. Now bishop to a5, only winning move. Queen captures an e6, check is fine, but king h8 you have nothing. But after bishop a5, there is no defense against rook to d8, will win the black queen. Uh, th th there is just no, no way to stop that. You could try queen to a7, but then, then you just get checkmated. Queen e6, check, now the back rank has been vacated, rook to d8, 
Dusher blocks and now Rook captures an F8 will be checkmate. So that's why after this Rook to F3 move, uh, the absolute best was Knight to B7. But he didn't play it. He played something else. He played Bishop to C3, probably with the idea of uh, going Bishop to D4 next to counter Magnus' strong Bishop on this diagonal. But now it is Magnus who is completely winning. The tables have now completely shifted. So feel free to pause the video once again and now find the winning idea for Magnus while I give you a couple of seconds. So uh, for those of you who were able to do it, congratulations on finding this uh, incredible idea. And for those of you who just want to enjoy the show, it is of course Rook to F2. This is what Magnus played and now it is evident that there is no escape. Now uh, Bishop D4 is pretty pointless as the G2 pawn is being pressured three times by the Rook, Bishop and Queen. So Rook to D2 was played, but it doesn't really help all that much. Uh, Magnus just played Bishop, captures on G2 with check and it was in this position on move 36 that Alexander Ariazantsev uh, resigned the game as there is nothing more to be done here. The problem is, okay, if, if bishop captures, then queen captures his checkmate. But if the king goes to g1, then rook captures on f1 is checkmate. Now it's checked from rook and the bishop on c5. And now, of course, the king has nowhere to go. Uh, it is checkmate. Uh, so yeah, a very, very weird game. Like I said, I have no idea if maybe this was a time trouble issue after rook to f3. Because it, if you don't find knight to b7, you just don't move. You, you don't move because you know that everything else is just lost. So I imagine maybe it was a time trouble thing or maybe he just um, missed Rook to F2. Again, uh, without Rook to F2, Magnus doesn't really have all that much. So really complicated game, but you can see how uh, uh, not just one player having the bishop pair, but both players having a deadly bishop pair can make it a whole lot difficult to calculate everything properly. And yeah, if you guys are interested, here are the standings of the tournament. Uh, let me just load that up. Uh... It was won by uh, Liviu Detranisipanu. These are the top 10 uh, of the event. Liviu Detranisipanu won the European Championship 2005 with 10 out of, out of 13 with a perfect uh, perfect tournament. 7 wins, 0 losses and 6 draws. Uh, uh, Rajabov in 2nd place with 9.5 out of 13 and Levon Arunyan with a 9 out of 13 in 3rd place. Or basically sharing 3rd place with uh, Sergei Karyakin, Vasily Vanchuk, Pavel Ilyanov and um, uh, Karen Azarian. Uh, also Alexander Velyavsky and Alexander Moisenko and then in 10th place we have Vadim Milov. Uh, Magnus uh, nowhere near uh, the, the top 10. I, I don't think he was even in the in the top 20 here uh, and it was a pretty big tournament, 229 players. Uh, but yeah, he did get this uh, beautiful win uh, and uh, well, I mean a complicated one but definitely a beautiful one. Uh, so yeah, that's the game. Hope you hope you enjoyed it. If you have any other favorite uh, long forgotten Magnus uh, brilliances, uh, feel free to share so we can uh, all enjoy them. Uh, I would like to thank Ravishing Reptiles YouTube, Ricky Black, I love you, Sonu, uh, Peter, uh, uh, Peter uh, Gebertsen, and Matthew Benoit for your contribution to my channel. Thank you a lot. I really appreciate it. As usual, you can check two of my previous videos here. Thank you all for watching, and I will see you soon. Continuing to check up on your wonderful suggestions, such as this one and whatever else happens in the chess world. Uh, thank you all. I will see you soon, and have an excellent rest of your day. Hello everyone and welcome to a really awesome game from a really uh, cool event you guys requested. A lot of you have requested this one as uh, uh, the lowest seed of the tournament, uh, Divya Deshmukh rated 22-16, has won the tournament, the uh, women's uh, Tata Steel India Rapid. Uh, and uh, she defeated some incredible players there, uh, including the, uh, the, the the top Indian women's chess player Hampi Konero and also women's world champion Juvenjan. Okay, she did not defeat her, she drew against her in round two. And... Um, uh, well, it, it was very uh, interesting until the very end. In the very end, uh, this is the final round. This is round nine. So Divya has to defeat Humpy uh, in order to at least contest for the first place. And um, uh, Juvenjun was facing Anna Ushenina. And if Juvenjun wins, uh, she will also be able to um, uh, sort of tie for first with, with the Divya. So let's see what happened in this one. A really, really uh, great game. Great middle game. Great end game. Great everything. So let's dive straight into it. So uh, Humpy has the white pieces and she opens with pawn to d4. Uh, we have knight to f6, pawn to c4, e6, and knight to f3. We have pawn to b6. Divya goes for the queen's Indian defense. Uh, sorry about that. 
uh, and pawn to g3. You will want to counter the uh, fianchetto of the light square bishop with a fianchetto of the light square bishop. So bishop to a6, the Nimsovic uh, variation, also known as the uh, exaggerated fianchetto. We have knight b to d2 and pawn to c5. So everything um, already seen before, nothing new here. Bishop g2, knight to c6 and d captures on c5. Now we have b captures on c5 and we have castles. Uh, bishop to e7, also preparing to castle, pawn to b3. Uh, Humpy wants to think to the dark square bishop as well. Castles and bishop to b2. We have pawn to d5 striking in the center. C captures on d5, e captures, uh, and now there is a game where rook to e1 was played, but here we have the immediate rook to c1, and it is now as of move 12 that we have a completely new game. Uh, so Divya continues development. We have queen to b6. Now the rooks are connected and ready to be put on uh, useful files, and rook to e1. Uh, getting off of this diagonal, so now you can advance the e pawn, and you would very much like to play pawn to e4, and that's why Divya starts. Opposite, he play, she plays knight to e4. Uh, we have knight to e5, offers a trade of, uh, of the knights here, but also threatening a fork with knight to d7. So Divya trades, knight captures, bishop captures, and now just rook a to d8. We have queen to c2 now, getting off of the d-file, uh, and uh, pawn to f5 now. Now the knight is nicely defended here, pawn to e3, and now queen uh, back to e6. Attacking the, knight, the bishop here, bishop back to b2, and now rook to c8. Now the pawn is nicely defended, you can bring the other rook to d8 and then you will have a lot of breakthroughs in maybe later on maybe h6 g5 and so on so knight to f3 uh, rook f to d8 and now queen back to b1 of course getting the queen off of the c file uh, bishop to f6 and now a uh, queen to a1 preparing to uh, bring the knight over to e5 if uh, divya does not trade bishops and she goes king to f7 uh, and this king to f7 move is uh, when i first saw the game i thought it was a draw offering uh, but you'll see just what happens here now you could choose between some moves bishop captures on f6 or pawn to a3 uh uh humpy goes for knight to e5 with check and divya just goes back king to g8 we have knight back to f3 king to f7 repeating the position but now humpy uh, uh stops the re repetition she plays pawn to h4 pawn to h6 and now again knight to e5 with check king to g8 knight to f3 King to f7 and knight to e5 check. King to g8, knight to f3. And here, if she, if she repeats with king to f7, uh, it will be a draw by threefold repetition. Uh, but uh, regardless of the rating uh, difference, she goes uh, uh, she goes uh, uh, for continuing play. Bishop captures on b2. And okay, queen captures. And now how do you continue this? Well, you could try to remaneuver the rooks or maybe try and get some sort of a breakthrough in. But she goes for pawn to g5. And now uh, it, it's not the most precise move, but it really requires you to um, uh, think in a, in, in a tough position. And the strongest move, as uh, it often is, is pawn to b4 here. It was not played in the game, but just to show you, uh, now, if you play pawn to c4, uh, you will, uh, uh, well, black will never be able to get this d4 moving. You can even play b5, bishop to b7, even a4 in, and you can get a knight to d4, you can get a knight to e5, also you can get a queen to d4, queen to e5, but uh, most importantly, black can never execute d4. Uh, however, in the game, rook e to d1 was played, and now it's much different. King to h7, we have h captures and g5, h captures, and now again, pawn to b4 is the idea, but she plays uh, queen to e5. She offers a queen trade, and Divya, I imagine, very happily trades. Captures, captures, and king to g7. We have rook to c2 now, preparing to double up on the c file, and king to f6, kicking away the knight from such an active square. Knight to f3, and now pawn to g4. Now, you could bring the knight to h4 or h2, but uh, those are uh, very passive squares for the knight. h2 is still okay. You can shift it over to f1 and then later on to d2. h4 uh, would be a bit too much. Uh, instead, she goes knight to e1. And now we have pawn to c4. Again, uh, not the most precise, but this is rapid game and they are both below a minute. Uh, d4 is uh, straight up winning. Uh, point is that after pawn to d4, uh, there's not all that much you can do to counter uh, black. For example, if pawn captures, pawn captures, you're going to play rook captures and now bishop captures. And this pawn is now incredible. The rook is already behind it. The, the bishop is very active. If you capture, then you just fix uh, black's pawn structure and improve the central presence. Uh, after pawn to c4, however, 
uh, it's a little bit different because now uh, you could capture an e4. And now, for example, bishop captures an e4, f captures a knight to g2. Again, you can never uh, uh, push this pawn uh, all the way to d4, and you don't really uh, have all that much here. If you play c captures on b3, you can just play rook captures on c8. Now, it is similar to what happened in the game, but here bishop to f1 was played, and now comes king to e5, rook d to c1, doubling up on the c file, and now knight to g5 with uh, the option of going knight to f3 knight to h3 bishop to e2 and now c captures on b3 and here you absolutely must play a, a captures on b3 but in the game humpy decided to trade rooks first she played rook captures on c8 and now i'm pretty sure even without pausing the video you can figure out how to uh, win this position there's only one move uh, and i'm sure you've already found that even without pausing and the move of course is uh rook captures on c8 rook captures on c8 but now not bishop captures on c8 we of course throw in the in-between move b captures on a2 and now look at this the rook is hanging the bishop is hanging and also there's the threat of a1 queen so you have to do you know uh, something to minimize casualties. You have to play rook to c1 to cover the queening square, but now bishop captures on e2, rook to a1 goes after the pawn. Uh, sorry, this was not played. This is what would happen if you go rook back to c1. And now bishop to c4 would uh, stop uh, you from ever capturing that. And this rook is now pretty much out of the game. So uh, Humpy decided to go uh, not, not to go back with rook to c1. She played rook to e8 with check. And after king to d6, now she just played knight to c2. She defended the a1 square with the knight. But of course, the bishop uh, is still gone. So bishop captures on e2, rook to a8, and now knight to f3 with check. We have king to h1 and now knight to e1. You could also play the immediate a6, uh, but first she goes for knight to e1. The idea being that if knight captures, you can just bring a queen into the game. Uh, but now knight to a1. Of course, uh, if, if you go for the pawn and try to give up the knight for two pawns, it's not all that great. If captures, captures, uh, the, uh, you can uh, simply defend the knight. So the, the, the two pieces will beat a rook always. Uh, so instead, knight to a1 was tried here, but now comes pawn to a6. Now the pawn is nicely defended. Defended, rook to c8 and now bishop to d3 and now look at this beautiful maneuver rook to c1 of course defending the back rank and attacking the knight here knight to c2 and that's all there is now the the problem is if you play king to g2 there's knight captures on a1 and after rook captures bishop to b1 uh forever you know enclosing the the rook in his tomb on, on a1 uh, and the king will simply go uh, c5, b4, b3, b2, and uh, gobble up the rook, and then uh, promote this pawn to a queen. So, of course, you can't do that. After knight c2, rook captures on c2 was played, but it doesn't help um, uh, Humpy all that much. Bishop captures, knight captures, and now just king to c5, king to g2, king to c4, and he was in this position on move 51 that uh, Humpy Canary resigned the game, uh, as there is nothing more to be done here. After you play a few more moves, king f1, of course, king comes to c, three and after knight a1 king b, b2 will uh, eliminate the knight and then you just promote your pawn to a queen so uh masterful play by uh by the uh bottom c divya deshmukh like i said 22 16 and um well there are uh 250 300 uh, 300 rating points higher rated players here in this tournament so absolutely incredible that she was able to win it. And uh, here are all of her results. So she did not go undefeated. She lost one game to Polina Shuvalova, who obviously played a spectacular tournament as uh, even the um, reigning world champion Juvenjun could not defeat her in the final round. She only got a draw and that's why uh, Divya got first place in this tournament, whereas uh, um, uh, women's world champion Juvenjun got second place with six and a half. And you can see that she won 91 rating point for this one event, which is, I mean, absolutely incredible, almost 100 rating points for a single tournament. Yeah, just, you know, went through everyone, uh, only uh, international master Polina Shuvalova uh, dealt the, uh, the only blow of, of the tournament. So yeah, uh, great stuff. Uh, congratulations to Divya on such a spectacular event. Uh, thank you guys for suggesting it. And uh, well, yeah, hope you enjoyed it. I mean, it was a gr great choice of an opening going for the Queen's Indian defense and then just uh, st uh, stabilizing. Uh, we thought that she was going to repeat with that King to F7 business, but it was, uh, you know, only only uh, testing your opponent. And maybe sometimes you want to even repeat the position a few times just to annoy your your opponent. Then your opponent is thinking, okay, are you going to repeat? But you're never really going to repeat. And she went for H6, G5, break, uh, broken through, and it was enough to, you know, uh, catch her off guard um, in, in rapid game at least.
Uh, so yeah, once again, really hope you guys uh, enjoyed it. Uh, I would like to thank uh, GersnyChessFestival.org.gg, Phil Maltus, Jerry Nasher, Rohan Tana, and David Kimura for your contribution to my channel. Thank you a lot. I really appreciate it. Uh, if, uh, as usual, you can check two of my previous videos here. Thank you for watching, and I will see you soon. Continuing to check up on your wonderful suggestions, uh, such as this one and whatever else happens in the chess world. Uh, so thank you all. I will see you soon, and have an excellent rest of your day. Hello everyone and welcome to round 9 of the FIDE Chess Olympiad 2022. It is uh, Pragyananda versus Vasiv Durarbaili. Uh, India 2 faces uh, uh, Azerbaijan and uh, it is one of the two big clashes that are happening in round 9. So India 2 faces Azerbaijan uh, and of course uh, the youngsters of Team Uzbekistan uh, face Armenia. Uh, so we're going to discuss about what happened in that match but first to get um, uh, some things out of the way. Uh, I know you guys are wondering about Gukesh, how did he play as he faced Shakhri and Mamidyarov, he had the white pieces, uh, it was a very very quick draw and uh, there was not really m much happening there. Uh, Gukesh I felt was in absolute control for the entire game, uh, in the end uh, he could not uh, pursue that 9 out of 9, uh, but I mean it would be uh, silly to, to, to try and push something against uh, Mamidyarov on board 1. Uh, so uh, his incredible run comes to an end, but even with a draw against Mamedyarov, he still gains rating points, so we're going to discuss the, the, the ratings in, um, uh, in, in the second video. Uh, so that's what happened on board one. On board two, we also had a draw uh, between um, Rauf Mamedov and uh, Nihal Sarin, uh, and on board four, India 2 suffered a loss. Uh, Raunak Sadvani uh, lost his game uh, to, to Abbasov, and now it is up to Pragyananda to, to, to level the score otherwise India will lose to Azerbaijan. Uh, so let's see what happened in this game. Prago has the white pieces and he opens with d4. We have knight to f6, c4, e6, knight to f3 and b6. Here uh, Durar Bailey goes for the Queen's Indian defense and we've uh, discussed this quite a lot ever since Alpha Zero said that uh, Queen's Indian defense is completely unbe uh, unplayable. Uh, humans haven't really played it all that much but we still see it from time to time uh, with some uh, new, new uh, ideas. Uh, so uh, let's let's see how Prague goes about this. We have g3. Uh, this is all uh, top standard theory, so nothing new here. Bishop to a6. Uh, we have b3 defending the c4 pawn and the bishop to b4 check. We have bishop to d2, captures on d2, queen captures, and now uh, we have pawn to c6. Uh, bishop to g2, uh, very nicely uh, developed uh, as the, the rook on a8 might be uh, hanging in some lines. And here just d5. Uh, we have castles and now knight b to d7, rook to c1, and now uh, here we have castles by Durar Bailey. And again, this has all been played before, a4 by Prago. And now comes bishop to b7. Bishop to b7 is the first real rare move of the game. Usually people just go queen to e7 here or rook to c8, but bishop to b7 is incredibly rare. And now uh, um, uh, Prago goes knight to c3. Uh, and uh, it is now as of move 12 that we have a completely new game. There is a game where a5 was attempted, Valentina Gunina played it against Anastasia Bondaruk in the uh, Russian Championship of 2017 for women uh, in St. Uh, St. Petersburg. Uh, but here, of course, we have knight to c3 and uh, now it's a completely new game. So rook to b8, uh, now it's new territory, Durar Bailey uh, gets the rook over to the b-file. Uh, like we said, the bishop controlling this diagonal, uh, you do not want your bishop there. And if uh, a5 is played or something like that, you might have uh, problems. Also, if the bishop moves, b5 is, is an option, so c5 is an option. Uh, uh, the rook is better placed uh, on b8. So here we have knight to e1 and now pawn to c5. Opening up the position, c captures on b5, c captures on d4 and now queen captures on d4 and now knight to c5. Of course now uh, you cannot go for any captures as the queen on, uh, on d4 would hang. So rook b to e1, uh, rook a to b1 uh, and now e captures on d5, uh, Durar Bailey just wins back his pawn. So knight to f3, and now knight to e6, chasing away Prago's queen, we have queen back to d1, and now knight to e4, offering a queen trade, and uh, while Prago could go for this, uh, it, it doesn't give him all that much. For example, you trade, knight captures, pawn captures, queen captures on d8, rook b captures, and now you can go knight, knight to e5, you, you can maybe uh, try and um, get this rook to c7, if the knight ever moves, but with the knight on e6, it's not a really uh, scary position for black. So Prague keeps uh, all of the material on the board. He goes knight to b5, 
uh, now controls the c7 square with the knight as well. So now queen to f6 and now rook to c2. And here uh, it seems like maybe you can kick away the knight, play a6, kick away the knight and get the knight to c3 to win some material. The problem is if you play a6, the knight comes to d4, the queen no longer guards the c3 square. So that's why uh, it, it is not a viable option. So here just a5 by Durerbaile and now pawn to e3. Uh, also, the, the rook on c2 uh, is doing a fine job guarding the f2 pawn, so if the knight on f3 ever moves, you don't have to worry about queen captures on f2. So, rook b to c8, and now rook b to c1, Prago doubles up on the c file, knight 6 to c5, uh, closing the c file, and now knight f to d4. And you can see that uh, Prago's pieces are now excellently placed, uh, the rook's controlling the c file, the bishop on g2, uh, but to Rebailly's pieces also doing uh, incredible work. The knights here are very, very strong, the queen here very active, and, uh, well, the bishop for the moment uh, hitting his own pawn, uh, but that's, uh, that, that's uh, you know, usually the fate of the, the light square bishop when you're playing the, the black pieces. It takes a while for it to come alive. So g6 and now queen to f3. Uh, Prague says, all right, uh, the only way to continue is to trade queens. And uh, it seems that Durabali agrees with Prague as he declines the trade. He goes back queen to e7, bishop to f1 now, uh, and knight to g5, kicking away the queen, queen to d1, and now queen back to f6. We have queen back to g4, and now knight g to e4. Uh, we have queen to f4, again offering a queen trade, and again Adurar Bailey declines this. He prefers his chances with queens on the board, and here Prago says, all right, uh, now it's my time to attack, and displace pawn to h4. Now, uh, h5 is coming, maybe even h6, as uh, black is without dark square bishop, so this would... Uh, uh, well, th this would uh, uh, make it very, very hard for, for, for you to play with black. So bishop to a6, and now comes pawn to h5. We have bishop captures on b5. Uh, here, Durabali decided that the bishop here was not all that impressive, and that it's better to just trade it away for one of the very strong knights. A captures on b5, and now rook c to e8. Uh, we have rook to d1, uh, still waiting with any, any pawn pushes here. You, you could push the pawn all the way to h6, but then uh, black would probably consolidate with something like uh, f6 or f5, king to h8, and his position would be uh, okay. So you have to wait with moves like this. So rook to d1, and now queen to d7, bishop to g2, and now pawn to f5. Uh, very, very nicely done. Uh, queen to f3, uh, now uh, d defending that h5 pawn, but now just pawn to g5. And here uh, things start to get really out of control. Here, the uh, point is if you try something like h6, maybe you want to bring the queen over to h5, uh, we could even see a draw by repetition. For example, rook f6 goes after the pawn, queen defends the pawn, rook to g6, now you can bring the queen back to f3, and now we might see a repetition, rook f6, queen h5, and so on, uh, because the uh, df5 pawn is hanging. And uh, if you if you move this rook over to f8 to defend it, then you no longer control the e5 square. Maybe the knight comes to c6, then to e5, and then could be could be anything. So instead, we have rook to b2. Prago prepares b4. Uh, if he can do this, he's going to open up the the a file. And now king to h8. Uh, the king will be much safer on this diagonal. Uh, b4 by Prago, and now a captures on b4. Rook captures, and now knight to c3, attacking the rook on d1, rook to d2, and now knight 3 to e4. Here, maybe uh, there was a way to uh, make an improvement here. The knight will come to uh, sorry, the knight will come to e4 at some point, but rook to a8 might be uh, a nice inclusion before that. But okay, knight 3 to e4, attacks the rook, rook to d1, and now knight to c3. Here, Durarvalu repeats once. Rook to d2, knight 5 to e4 now, bringing the other knight closer, and now rook to c2, uh, putting pressure on the knight, and now it's a little bit different. Now, of course, you can play rook to e8, which happens in the game, but now rook b3, and now you're just threatening to give up a rook for the two knights. So, rook to a1 with check, uh, not king to h2. If you go king to h2, then it's game over. Then just g4, and you don't have a way of defending your h5 pawn. Queen has to move, now comes queen to e8, incredible move. Uh, not not even queen to f7, then you can play queen to h6. After queen to e8, now it's a game over, because now, uh, if, you, if you try this queen to h6 move, there's rook f6, and now the queen has to go back, and then queen captures on h5 just wins the game. So, after rook to a1 check, bishop to f1, uh, Pragananda goes... Um, 
for the absolute strongest move and now knight to a4 preparing to shift the knight back to c5 uh, rook to d3 and now rook to e1 and this move is maybe a bit of a, a time waste maybe knight uh, knight coming to c5 is the is the quicker way to go but uh, uh, this game is so complicated it's hard to really say what is what rook to e1 was played and now rook to a3 now Prago goes uh, for the doubling of the rooks on the a file Knight a to c5 and the rook c to a2. Now preparing to bring the uh, to bring the rooks into the game with rook to a7, maybe even rook to a8. So f4, Durarabali continues his attack and now e captures on f4. We have g4, finally chasing away the queen. Now the h5 pawn becomes weak. Queen to h1, here the uh, h5 pawn is still being defended and maybe Prago can even shift the queen into the attack via the h4 square. If the knight moves, maybe queen g5, maybe you can gain uh, access to some of, some of these squares. So knight to e6, offering a trade of knights and here Prago goes for it. Rook to a8. Uh, we have knight captures on d4 and before capturing on d4 you ha we have to uh, decide that this is the best course of action for black because the knight guards the rook on f8 but if you don't play this you don't really have a move so just to give you an example if you try something like king g8 now you're defending the rook knight captures on d4 becomes an idea uh, Prago can just trade rook captures king captures go knight to c6 and here with the rook having access to a8 and queen having access, uh, access to h4 uh, it's game over. Black will just get checkmated regardless of what you play. Let's say knight c7, you stop the rook, queen to h4 now. And there is nothing you can do here. If d4, you start pushing your pass pawn, uh, just rook e2. You offer a rook trade and once black uh, does this, uh, black is really without moves. Point being, if you play something like d3, we can even capture this and if queen captures, just queen e7 check. King to g8, now h6 and now you are getting checkmated. If queen e1, let's say you try something like queen a1 to stop checkmate, then comes knight to e5, and now there is no defense against both queen f7, and uh, now uh, the knight is uh, blocking g7, queen to g7. So that, uh, that being the idea. So knight captures on d4 is the only move black has, Durarabali plays it, now comes rook captures on f8, and now king to g7, attacks Prague's rook, and now rook f back to a8. Here rook to b8 is the engine's favorite, but it's such a weird move to play going after a pawn in a, in a, you know, a crazy situation like this. So rook f to a8, probably goes for the more human move. Uh, and now comes the knight to f3 with check. And this seems like a really good move, uh, but it's actually a move that again gets Durarabali into a losing position. Here of course you see that the rooks are coming to a7, so you have to play king to h6. But, I mean, uh, a, a crazy position. Knight f3 check, king to g2, now comes king h6, but now uh, it is much too late. Uh, but Prago does not find the, the correct way. He plays rook to c2, uh, the correct way is actually to play rook to a7. It seems like a simple move to, uh, to miss, but the point is after you play queen to e6, because you have to keep an eye uh, on the b6 pawn and also you kind of have to keep an eye on the h7 pawn. But now, for example, rook h8 goes after the pawn here, you will defend it queen f5, hoping to give up the queen for two rooks, but of course white is not forced to capture. Rook b8 goes after the pawn, and once you defend it again, now you're going to play rook to b7, and now you are attacking this pawn and this pawn, and uh, black for, of course cannot defend both of them. If you try knight to f6, just bishop to d3, and that's it. Look at this. <laughs> rook captures on, uh, on h1, rook captures on h7 with check, knight captures, and rook captures here with checkmate. So that's kind of the point. Uh, so easy, easy to miss. Uh, so here rook to c2 was played, Prague wants to go for rook, rook to c6, and, and now comes uh, queen to e7. Here you should really close the um, uh, position with knight to c5, but I believe this is what Prago had in mind and he calculated it well. He, his idea was that he gives up the exchange here, uh, he plays rook a6 check, king goes here, h6 check, king moves and now b6 and now with queen having access to h5 and the pass pawn here, he has act excellent winning chances. So instead, uh, okay, rook c2, queen to e7 by Durarabali, now comes rook to c6 with check, knight to f6 and now rook to a3 here. Prago has ideas of even capturing an f3, but the main idea is going for rook to e3, especially if the rook on e1 moves. Uh, and now what do you play? Uh, well, uh, it's uh, very, very hard to make a move here. R uh, uh, the rook is hanging, but then you allow rook captures on f6. So here, 
uh, Prago is uh, deciding to give back the exchange and there isn't anything better that you can play. So Dora Bailey captures here, Prago captures on f6, king to g7 and now rook captures on b6. The only way to continue playing this, uh, but now h6. Without the white being able to push h6, uh, it's very very hard to get this queen into the game. So here Prago goes for an, a nice uh, little move, rook to g6 check. And incredible as it is here, Dorer Bailey makes a, a critical, critical error. Here he has to play king to f7. And of course it makes sense because you know what, what is coming. Uh, but he played king to h7. Point is that after king to f7, uh, you can simply play rook captures on g4 and there is no good move white can make. Next move is knight to d2 and uh, you will... Uh, you're just lost, you're, you're losing the bishop, there's no way to play this. However, after king to h7, uh, there is a way to play this. Rook captures on g4 was played, and now the problem is that knight to d4 is no longer, knight to d2 is no longer an option, because now the king is on a light square, bishop d3 check, and we pick up the rook on e1, so uh, you can't play that. So here, d4, Durer Bailey starts pushing his pass pawn, now comes rook to g6, the only winning move for Prago. Uh, and the point being now that um, uh, if knight to d2, you can just play king to h3, and after rook captures on f1, uh, you just checkmate the black king. That's the point. Uh, the knight to d2 no longer works. King to h8, and now queen to g7 will be checkmate. So instead, after rook to g6, queen to e7 was played by Durer Bailey, but now uh, the uh, position is still winning for Prago. He has a beautiful winning move. So feel free to pause the video and win the game for Prago while I give you a couple of seconds. So uh, for those of you who were able to do it, congratulations on uh, always looking for incredible ways to sacrifice your queen. And for those of you who just want to enjoy the show, it is of course Bishop to D3. Uh, we can do it in even slower slow motion because this is quite quite the move. Uh, and basically it, it looks fancy but it's a queen trade so congratulations to everyone who spotted it. Um, yeah, there is no defense here for black. Point is if you capture the queen, now we just play rook to e6 check, we pick up the black queen and of course the position is complete winning king g7 rook captures here with check king f8 rook c7 and it's a very simple win for white b6 b7 b8 as the bishop covers b1 so the rook cannot go behind the pass pawn so instead we have queen to a3 here uh, now saying okay you uh, open up a discovery i'm just gonna capture your bishop uh, but that also means that uh, prago will win the rook on e1 so here rook to e6 with check Queen captures on d3, eliminating the checker, and now rook captures on e1. Knight captures on e1, and now queen captures on e1, uh, leaving Prago up uh, many, many pawns. So here, queen captures on b5, but now queen e4 check, king to g8, and down comes queen to g6. And it was in this position on move 66 that Vasip Durar Bailey resigned the game, and Pragyananda is the hero of round 9 as he saves the day for India too. Uh, as like we said, um, Sadvani lost on, on board four, and now the, uh, the the match is equalized by Prago's great victory over Vasip Durar Bailey. Here you resign because all of the pawns will now fall. For example, queen captures on h6. Now you will give some check to pick up this pawn at some point, or even if king e8, you can even go queen g6 check. And now if king d8, you can even play queen g5 check and force a queen trade. It's incredibly simple to win this. So of course that's why uh, Durar Bailey resigned. The white king is close enough to stop the pawn here so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, so yeah, after uh, queen to g6, Dora Bailey resigned and a very, very important victory for, uh, uh, for Pragyananda. Uh, now, what does this mean for the actual standings of the Olympiad? We're going to discuss this after the second video that I make, uh, as uh, the second important match was uh, Armenia facing Uzbekistan, and, uh, well, let's just say Armenia did not have the greatest of times. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's the game. Uh, hope you guys uh, hope you hope you guys enjoyed it. It was a really wild one. Uh, many chances for both sides, but in the end, uh, Prague prevails. Uh, I would like to thank Braxton Reynolds, uh, David Kimura, uh, Tarajan Rengasami, uh, Hugh Boobies, and Joshua Hadley for your contribution to my channel. Thank you a lot. I really appreciate it. As usual, you can check two of my previous videos here. Thank you all for watching, and I will see you soon. Continuing the coverage of the Olympiad until it finishes. Uh, so thank you all. I will see you soon, and have an excellent rest of your day. 
Hello everyone and welcome to game 66 from the TCEC Super Final. It's uh, Stockfish vs. Leela Chess Zero and a lot of you have been asking me in the comments how come I never show a gameplay the, uh, where Stockfish wins. Uh, well, uh, Stockfish has a different approach to games than Leela Chess Zero as Leela is a neural network and uh, usually the games uh, don't... don't uh, seem all that, uh, how, to, how to put it, important to me and uh, not all that interesting. Uh, it's an engine's approach uh, to games and uh, th that's why I rarely cover it. Uh, but every now and then there will emerge a game that will be uh, simply out of this world. When I saw this one, uh, it reminded me of Rubinstein's Immortal uh, game against Rotlevi in 1907, uh, which uh, if you enjoyed this game, you're welcome to check that game. I also covered it on my channel. Uh, but okay, without further ado, let's check it out. As you all know, the openings are pre-arranged, uh, so this time uh, they play what is... Um, well, there's been a lot of fuss about the Queen's Indian defense because Alpha Zero really, really outplayed Stockfish in pretty much every game where Stockfish tried using the uh, the Queen's Indian defense. Uh, but okay, here Leela has the black pieces, so we'll see what happens here. We have d4, knight to f6, uh, c4, e6, knight to f3, and now b6. The Queen's Indian, sorry, b6, the Queen's Indian defense is on the board. And uh, I have to mention uh, that uh, when Leela played this game, uh, this position with the white pieces, Stockfish was able to hold it to a draw uh, with the black pieces. Uh, but okay, g3, uh, the Fianchetto variation, bishop to a6, and now b3. Uh, we have d5, uh, bishop to g2, d captures on c4, now comes knight to e5, and bishop to b4 check. Uh, king goes to f1, this is a well-known line, it's, uh, it's been played uh, plenty of times uh, between human players as well. Uh, bishop to back to d6, as the bishop no longer has any purpose now that the king moved, uh, and knight captures the pawn back on c4. Uh, we have knight to d5, and now bishop to b2. Uh, we have knight to c6, and here, uh, this is move 10, and uh, when uh, Leela was playing with the white pieces, Leela went for e4 here. But Stockfish goes for a different line. e4 has been played uh, amongst human players as well, uh, the move Leela chose. But Stockfish goes for h4, and it's actually Stockfish that brings a completely new game now uh, for, uh, for us to enjoy. Uh, here Leela goes f5. Most likely as Leela played e4, uh, when Leela played with the white pieces, uh, she wants to prevent Stockfish from pushing e4. Uh, knight b to d2. Uh, we have castles by, uh, by Leela and now king to g1. You don't want this king to be on this diagonal when you finally do push uh, e4. Uh, the knight is nicely placed here to support the, this advancement of the pawn on e4. Uh, now comes b5. Uh, knight captures some d6, c captures some d6, now improving the, the central pawn structure here, and now finally e4. Uh, f captures, oops, sorry about that. Uh, f captures an e4, knight captures an e4, and now queen to d7. Uh, connecting rooks, developing the queen, and now knight to g5. And already uh, there's going to be a lot of action happening now. The knight is on g5, as you can see, uh, black's... Uh, uh, pawn structure uh, uh, in front of the king has already been somewhat compromised, the, uh, the f pawn is missing, and Leela makes further weakening of the king side by playing h6, and Stockfish no longer reacts to this. We have queen to g4, and uh, this queen to g4 is not a peace sacrifice. If Even if the knight was captured, you don't have to play h capture on g5 immediately, you could go bishop capture on d5. You cannot recapture because the queen is unguarded on d7. And after bishop d7, you just go back, and then white pretty much has a, an attack for free. You're just going to open up the h file and uh, win the game. Uh, so, after this queen to g4 move, we have rook to f5 by Leela, uh, blocking off uh, this. And also, the uh, rook is now controlling the knight here, defending the knight on d5. Uh, but still, uh, the knight doesn't move. We have rook to e1 by Stockfish. Now, what's the idea now? Well, now if h captures on g5, now do you see what uh, Stockfish has in, had in mind? Uh, queen captures on f5. This is just awesome. Uh, pawn captures queen and now, sorry, not the king. Bishop captures on d5 with check. Uh, king to h7, now you capture on g5 with a discovered check. King goes to g6 and now rook to e6 check uh, wins the queen. Uh, either you have to give up the queen or if you go king to g5, then comes f4 and rook to g6 will be checkmate. So after this rook to e1 move, uh, Lila goes back. We have knight to f6. 
Uh, and now queen goes to e2. And again, uh, it's not possible to capture the knight because now you just capture and there are uh, so many threats here. You don't have time to recapture here. You would have to give up the knight uh, because of the threat. Uh, bishop captures knight on c6 and the queen captures on e6. So here you just have to play something like d5 to defend the knight. And then after you capture here, like I said, it's not it's not even a peace sacrifice and the white would just be so much better here. The queen is uh, coming uh, into the attack and it will all be over very soon. Uh, so after queen to e2, we have rook to e8 now. Uh, Lila brings this rook to, to help out with the defense of the e6 pawn. And now finally the knight goes back. Uh, here you could capture on e6. Uh, Stockfish for some reason does not go for this line. Knight captures. It seems like a perfectly nice pawn grab. Uh, but still Stockfish thought uh, thought it to be uh, a lesser move than, than what, uh, what Stockfish played. Uh, after rook to e8, uh, first we have knight to e4. Uh, now knight to d5 and now bishop to h3. Uh, the rook is under attack, rook to f7 and now bishop to g4 with the idea of bishop to h5 uh, winning material. Uh, rook f to e7 and now uh, we have rook to h2. Uh, queen to d8 and now we have f3. So strengthening the position here, uh, we have knight to b8. Uh, e5 was also a possibility here but uh, first uh, Lila decides to uh, remaneuver the knight. Uh, we have queen to c2, now the queen is very nicely placed here, the queen is eyeing the h7 square and the knight to g5 will once again become a very huge threat. Uh, we have bishop to c8, now Lila uh, really controls the e6 square here, uh, but Stockfish now uh, dives uh, right into the attack. Knight to g5. And now, uh, of course, you still uh, cannot, ca I mean, the threat is queen to h7, this would lead to checkmate, but uh, if you capture, then h captures again, now the rook will support the queen's, uh, 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 the queen's jump to the h7 square. So after this knight to g5, uh, you still cannot capture the knight. First, knight to f6, it's important that the knight controls the h7 square, uh, but now comes bishop to h5, and this is just amazing how this bishop keeps uh, wiggling in uh, in black's position. Uh, of course, you still cannot capture it due to the same checkmating idea. Queen h8 will be checkmate. Uh, so after bishop h5, the rook is under attack. Rook to f8 is played, and now even bishop to g6, now taking full control of the h7 square and preparing to uh, bring the bishop all the way back. Uh, so we have knight to a6 now. Uh, if you play something like rook to c7, attack the queen to maybe get, get some activity, doesn't really help you. Queen d3, uh, still uh, everything is uh, uh, in white's favor, doesn't really help you. Rook e7, you'll just get this rook over here, uh, increase the pressure, and the white will just continue building up. So after bishop g6, we have knight to a6 by Leela, and now comes queen to d2. Uh, we have b4, uh, now comes g4. And here comes knight to c7. Lila now decides to give up the b4 pawn to gain some activity. Uh, and Stockfish decides, okay, now it's time to, to grab some pawns. Uh, queen captures on b4, but now knight f to d5. Uh, attacking the queen, we have bishop to h7 first, king to h8, and only now queen back to d2. So, okay, for the price of one pawn, Lila does manage to activate the pieces a bit. Uh, knight to f4. Uh, we have bishop back to b1. So this is uh, just fascinating here in this game. Oh, okay, uh, Rubinstein had had the black pieces against Rotlevi, uh, but it's similar. The bishops were slicing all the way here, but now Stockfish's bishops are slicing all the way here. This is just uh, beautiful how this bishop came all the way from g2 to h3 to g4 to h5 to g6 to h7 and then went all the way back to b1. Uh, but okay, bishop to a6. Now the knight and the rook are doing a nice job covering the e6 pawn, so the bishop can be activated. Uh, we have knight to h7 now, attacking the rook, rook f to f7, and now comes g5. And here you don't really have the option of closing the position with h5 because g6 will win you the rook. The knight is controlling f8 uh, and f6, and the bishop, of course, is guarding f5, so black would lose material here. Uh, so after g5, we have knight to h5. Uh, and now uh, uh, Stockfish simply captures here. We have G captures and now comes D5 with check. Seems like a weird idea. Why would you uh, deliver this check just to allow black to close the position with E5? Uh, but Stockfish has a very nice plan. Queen captures on H6. And it seems like a weird move. Why would you allow rook captures on H7? But this is what Stockfish had in mind. Uh, Lila does play rook captures on H7. And now comes rook captures on E5. And this is just uh, this is just wild. 
Uh, now, after this move, everything uh, everything is just working in White's favor. Everything is all the pieces are in, are in the right place. Uh, both the bishops, the rook, the queen, and the, even the rook on h1. <clears throat> Uh, sorry about that, will be a part of the attack. Uh, so what's the point here? Okay, if you capture the rook, then it's game over. Bishop captures on e5 with check, uh, and now you will either capture here and you get a queen captures on h7 checkmate, or you will have to block. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, not capturing, but uh, you could go rook to g uh, king to g8, uh, but then you get bishop captures on h7, rook captures on h7, and now rook g2 check. Knight to g7, and now it's just all over. Uh, rook captures on g7. Uh, king to f8, now queen captures on h7, there's no defense against queen to h8, checkmate. Uh, you, whatever you play, you still you get checkmated very quickly. So this is what happens if you decide to capture the rook. But what about capturing the queen? Surely you can capture the queen. Uh, if you capture the queen, it's a forced line that leads Stockfish into a, into a winning endgame. If rook captures queen, then you get uh, rook captures on h5, uh, delivering a discovered check here. After rook to g7 check, uh, now uh, you block with rook to g2, and now while blocking check, you also attack the pinned piece. Uh, so rook captures on h5, bishop captures on g7 with check, uh, king to g8, you don't have the option of going to h7, you have to go in front of the rook, and now bishop to f6, check, wins the queen. Uh, king f8, bishop captures, the knight is under attack, so first rook captures here, threatening rook to d1, check to win the bishop. Uh, but now just uh, bishop to e4, you attack the rook, rook to d1, check, king to h2, and now knight to e6. And after the bishop uh, joins the game, now you have this endgame where white has a bishop pair against a bishop and a knight, both uh, Lila and Stockfish have rooks. Uh, uh, but Stockfish uh, is up to uh, two passed pawns, which will be winning in the end. Uh, Lila, of course, knows this. So after rook captures on e5, a powerful move, uh, Lila goes for rook to g7 check. So not capturing the rook or the queen, but first delivering rook to g7 check. Uh, and now we have uh, rook to g2. Rook to g5 seems like a nice idea uh, to, to immediately attack the pinned piece from here. Uh, but here rook captures is just winning for black as the knight from h5 also controls the g7 square now. So instead, after rook to g7 check, we have rook to g2, and now rook captures uh, on h5. Sorry, uh, rook captures on uh, uh, h6, uh, finally grabbing the queen. Uh, you don't have uh, enough time to capture on g2 with check, because after king captures, uh, capturing the queen results in mate in one, because uh, both of the bishops are controlling both g7 and h7. So after rook to g2, we have rook captures on h6, and now finally rook captures on h5. Uh, knight to e8, defending the rook, and now bishop captures on g7. Knight captures, rook captures on h6, king to g8, and now once again you will just attack the pinned piece. So rook to h7. Uh, so uh, Stockfish will also win Lila's knight on g7. We have queen to b6 check, king to h1, and now uh, finally king to f8, and the rook captures here. So now we have this position where both Lila and Stockfish have a bishop, but Stockfish has two rooks against the queen, which is almost always favorable, and not only that, Stockfish is up three pawns. Uh, two of those uh, are passed pawns, so that's quite an advantage. Uh, Queen to e3. Alila preferred this position than the one we've shown where it's immediately the endgame where Alila is down just two pawns. But here uh, it's still a queen and the king is somewhat open on h1. So perhaps uh, the game can be saved via some sort of a perpetual check. Uh, we have uh, bishop to e4 now controlling uh, both f3 and d5 pawns. A very nice defensive structure in the center. Queen to e1 check. We have uh, rook to g1 now blocking. Queen to e3 and now rook to h5. Uh, we have king to e7, now rook goes back to g7 with check, king f6, we have rook to g6 check, king to f7, and now rook to h7 check. So slowly but surely, uh, you know, Lila is running out of uh, squares for her king. Uh, king to f8, now comes rook to f6 check. King to g8, and now uh, and now comes, no, not this rook, but rook to e6. And the threat is rook to e8 checkmate. Uh, you cannot, of course, allow this. We have queen to e1 check by Lila, king to h2, and now comes queen to f2 check. King h3, and now not allowing this checkmate, uh, so you pin the rook. The, finally, the king is on h3, so you can pin the rook. Uh, we have rook to c7, forcing uh, Lila to capture here on e6, but first queen to f1 check. King g4, and now bishop captures on e6 with check. 
We have pawn captures on e6, now creating a very strong pass pawn. Uh, queen to g1 check, we have king to h5, and now queen to g3. Still, Lila tries to get something out of the position. If, if Stockfish were to push the pawn immediately, then queen e5 would allow the game to uh, perhaps be saved. After king g4, the king can now block the pawn. And, you know, it's a, it's still a game. Uh, but after this queen to g3 move, Stockfish goes for rook to f7, now preparing to block this check with bishop to f5, uh, which happens, queen e5 check, bishop to f5, and now queen to d5, uh, preparing to meet the push of the pawn with capturing the rook, uh, but also just, you know, making a move and pinning the, the bishop here. Uh, but king to g5 now. We have queen to d2 check, we have f4, and now comes queen to f2, and here uh, there are no more good good uh, defensive ideas for Lila. Here you have a, a forced checkmate. So feel free to pause the video and try to find this idea. It's not it's not all that difficult, especially now that you know that it exists. Uh, for those of you who were able to do it uh, after pausing the video, congratulations, you are an excellent uh, checkmater of neural networks. And for those of you who just want to enjoy the show, bishop to h7 check. Uh, after this move, uh, Lila Chess 0 resigned the game, and Stockfish created this brilliant, brilliant game that, uh, well, as I said, it, it really just reminded me of, of that Rubinstein's Immortal uh, due to the bishop pair and the, the, the wonderful... Uh, queen sacrifice. Uh, now the only square available to the king is king to h8, and now you get, uh, of course, you want to get to h6 and deliver rook to f8 checkmate, but first you have to do something about queen captures on h4. So here you create a shield for yourself, you push the pawn to h5, and now after uh, a little check, king h6, and now there are no more checks. Uh, the rook is controlling the f4 pawn, and whatever move black makes, it will just be rook to f8 checkmate. Okay, first black will of course block, but either way. So yeah, after bishop to h7 check, uh, Lila chess 0 resigned the game, and really, really just uh, this uh, moment here uh, after this uh, queen captures on h6, rook captures, and now uh, this monstrosity, rook captures on e5. This is just, just beautiful. Uh, so yeah, uh, really uh, an amazing game. Uh, if you haven't uh, seen my video, it, it's a really, really an old video. Uh, Rubinstein's Immortal against Rotlevi in 1907 uh, lasts like four minutes. It will be the first link in the description below if you haven't seen it and, uh, you, and you enjoyed this game. Uh, do check it out. It'll really blow your mind uh, that Akiba Rubinstein, really, really an amazing player also. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's the game. I do hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I think Lila is still in the lead uh, in the TCEC by one point. I think this is game 70-something 70, 70 now already. We've just seen game 66, but few other games were played. And, uh, you know, we're getting closer and closer to that 100 to, to decide the winner of the TCEC Super Final. And, uh, you know, who knows, maybe the winner will get the challenge Alpha Zero or, or not. We'll see. Uh, but yeah, uh, I would like to thank Benjamin Forbes, uh, Brian Colling, Milos Knežević, uh, David Kaisa, and Rafael Sol Solars for a contribution to my channel. Thank you a lot, I really appreciate it. As usual, you can check two of my previous videos here. Thank you all for watching, and I will see you soon, uh, hopefully with some more interesting content, continuing the Capablanca saga and, you know, doing what we usually do here. Uh, thank you all, and uh, have an excellent rest of your day, and check out the, the Rubinstein's Immortal. See you soon. Hello everyone, and welcome to a very nice, intense maneuvering game between Alpha Zero and Stockfish. Uh, unlike a couple of uh, previous videos between Alpha Zero and Stockfish that were from the opening book uh, that was used in TCEC 2016, uh, this one does not contain any any prior opening knowledge, and it is uh, everything just uh, you know play, play whatever you want. And it's interesting uh, for some reason Stockfish again goes for the Queen's Indian defense, even though uh, it lost plenty of games to Alpha Zero already using the same defense. Uh, but regardless, it, I'm sure you're all going to enjoy the game as it features uh, a lot of things you can use in your own games. Uh, but before we check out the actual game, uh, I would like to th uh, take this opportunity to uh, invite all of you to a very nice story. Now, I was having a beer with my brother-in-law, uh, Yozarov, you might know him, he also runs a chess channel. Uh, as you can see, he is uh, currently at some 921 subscribers and uh, he told me uh, that he's preparing a very nice video about the outside past pawn. 
Now, there are a lot of videos already on YouTube regarding the outside pass pawn, uh, but he said that he, he's been studying the outside pass pawn intensely and that he's ready to share some very nice secrets uh, about the outside pass pawn, you know, how it could be a weakness, could be a strength, uh, and so on. So, uh, I invite you to check it out. Uh, I will put the first thing you will see in the description below will be a link to his channel. Uh, so, feel free to check it out, check out his content, and if you enjoy it, uh, feel free to subscribe. Uh, I thought uh, as tomorrow is, uh, you know, Christmas, it would be be a very nice Christmas present uh, to, uh, to sur surpass 1,000 subscribers uh, on, on such a day. And also today is uh, his wife's birthday, so feel free to congratulate him about that as well if you can spare a minute. Uh, that being said, let's check out our game. Uh, Alpha Zero has the white pieces and uh, we have a D4 on the board. Knight to f6, c4, e6, and now comes knight to f3. And for some reason, Stockfish uh, doesn't know it's the latest trend to transpose into the queen's gambit declined. So b6. We have the queens in the defense uh, for, uh, I don't know, uh, for the, well, uh, <laughs> uh, considering they played probably millions of games, uh, this uh, is uh, a million time for, for Stockfish, but uh, we've seen already uh, at least 15 games where the queen's gambit declined, the, the queen's in the defense was played. Uh, g3, uh, we have bishop to b7, Fink arrowing the light square bishop, as is uh, often the case here, black wants to take control of the e4 square. Uh, bishop to g2, bishop to e7, this is all standard theory of the queen's Indian defense. Uh, knight to c3, and now comes castles. Uh, alpha also castles, we have knight to e4, uh, offering a trade of knights here. Uh, bishop to d2, and now comes d5, sorry, not d6, uh, but d d5. And uh, this has all been played before. This is still considered standard book theory of the Queen's Indian defense. Uh, C captures on d5, E captures on d5, and here we have Queen to b3. Uh, this, for example, is a move uh, Vasily Ivanchuk played in 2015 in the World Rapid Championship against Anton Korobov. And uh, Korobov played knight captures on d2, and Korobov won a very nice game. Uh, Ivanchuk really attacked like a, like a madman, uh, but Korob Korobov defended properly and in the end won the game. I always say Korobov is really an amazing player so whenever you get a chance to check out a game by Anton Korobov you know feel free to do it you will not be sorry uh, but here uh, we have a new move by Stockfish c5 and now we have a completely new game c5 in this position has not been played before uh, and here alpha goes bishop to f4 uh, basically saying that Korobov's knight captures on d2 was a good move as alpha does not uh, allow this capture uh, we have knight to a6, Stockfish keeps developing, uh, perhaps this knight uh, can come to, 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 to b4 in the future, or, or perhaps, uh, let's say, c7, b5, and then, and then what not, depending on what, what alpha plays. Uh, rook f to d1, uh, and now comes c4, and this c4 is the most exciting moment in the game. Not the most exciting, but it's a really exciting moment, because it's really a committal move. Uh, for example, you could also capture here, but that doesn't really gain anything. After knight captures, you just improve uh, the, the position of white's pieces, let's say captures, captures, and then bishop to f6, you put the bishop on, on this very nice diagonal, white moves the queen, and still white will have... Uh, a, a very comfortable game here, so uh, you, you, we're gonna go with the old to take is a mistake, if, if you're not gaining anything. Stockfish instead plays c4, and this is a very committal move. Uh, yes, you have created a, a very strong c4 pawn, uh, but the base of the pawn chain, the d5 pawn, w is now very weak, and this is what alpha will use uh, as as a like a homing beacon for for the rest of the game and it's going to be very enjoyable uh queen to c2 uh, we have knight to b4 attacking the queen once again queen c1 and now queen to d7 and here you see stockfish has a knight on b4 on e4 uh stockfish still has the bishop pair the rooks are yet to be developed uh, wherever and uh, it seems uh, that stockfish gains a lot of space here also the pawn is uh, you know quite a nuisance here on c4 and alpha goes h4 and it really seems like yeah wh whenever there is like doubt or anything just push push h4 seems levon aronian was right all along uh rook a to c8 stockfish keeps developing uh, at some point white might decide to challenge uh, black c4 pawn with would be three and uh, you know having a rook and c8 is always very nice 
Uh, we have a3 attacking the knight here, knight captures on c3, b captures on c3, and now comes knight back to c6. So here we have a case of uh, white's c3 pawn being weak, but also black's d5 pawn is very weak. And it will be interesting to see how black will go about this uh, c weak c3 pawn, and how alpha will deal with the weak d5 pawn. Uh, queen to b1. Uh, and okay, perhaps some ideas like queen to b5 offering a queen, tr queen trade are possible in the future. Uh, rook c to e8 now, the rook is no longer useful on the c file. And now comes rook to e1. Uh, perhaps alpha has some sorry ideas of pushing e4 in the future as both the queen and the rook are uh, controlling d4 square. Knight to a5, this b3 square would now be a very nice outpost for black's knight. Uh, but now comes a move that, uh, well... Seems like seems like an obvious move. Knight to g5. Yes, you are threatening checkmate, uh, and it seems like uh, a useless move. Of course, Black will deal with this threat, but also you're forcing Black to deal with it now. Uh, how you're gonna deal with it? Will you push g6? Will you push f5? Will you capture the knight here? If you capture the knight, uh, then you've just given up the bishop pair without really gaining anything. Not really something you want to do. Uh, perhaps ideas like king h2, bishop to h3 are coming and uh, white will control a lot of important squares. So here black deals with it with f5. Okay, you've closed this diagonal and now alpha goes back. Knight to f3. Uh, now the e5 square becomes a very, uh, you know, convenient. Uh, bishop to f6, uh, and now comes rook to a2. Uh, we have h6 by Al uh, by Stockfish, and now even a4. Uh, and okay, queen to e6, and now comes king to h2. Uh, a very nice idea. Uh, Alpha's plan here is to push h5 and create a very strong outpost for his knight uh, on g6. Uh, and it's very interesting. Now comes bishop to c8. The bishop is no longer useful on this uh, diagonal, as there's no pressure at the moment against the d5 pawn. Uh, but now comes rook to h1, uh, very nice move, knight to knight back to c6, and now comes h5. And here it's very interesting what happens if Stockfish decides to attack this pawn with, let's say, queen to f7. Uh, then bishop to d6 is very strong, you attack the rook, and now even though this comes with check, after the king moves, the queen is under attack. Queen has to move, and now you're just gonna uh, get rid of this uh, rook, and you're up the exchange, and you will have a much better game. So here, Stockfish first uh, plays king to h8, makes room for the rook on g8, so now bishop to d6 in the future, if the queen attacks the pawn, will not be such a problem. Uh, we have knight to g1, uh, a very nice move. Uh, the g6 square is a very nice outpost for white's knight. Uh, but if you play knight to h4, then black can eliminate it with the bishop. So white's plan is next, knight to g1 to h3, uh, then the dark square bishop will move from f4, then the knight comes to f4, then to g6, and then hopefully at some point it will come to the very nice central square e5, if nothing uh, is traded by then. Uh, so we have knight to g1, as planned. Queen to f7, attacking the pawn, but now comes bishop to f3. The knight just uh, freed uh, the f3 square for the white bishop, so now the bishop is guarded. Uh, we have rook back to d8, now taking away the d6 square from uh, the bishop, uh, and now comes knight to h3, as planned. King back to g8, uh, and now, as this bishop has to move to make uh, room for the knight, we notice this beautiful diagonal. Uh, so, what do you play here? Bishop to c1. The bishop is now ready to come to a3. Uh, rook f to e8, uh, not allowing this uh, to come with an attack on the rook, uh, but also putting pressure against white e2 pawn. Uh, queen to b5 now, uh, a very nice maneuver with the queen as the knight on c6 is still unguarded. Uh, bishop to b7 defending and now comes rook to d1. Uh, we have knight to a5, again hoping to bring the knight over to b3, but now queen back to b1 as the f5 pawn is also unguarded. Uh, bishop back to c8, defending here the pawn, and now comes knight to f4. So here you can see that white did all of this maneuvering with the knight. The knight was on f3, came to g1, came to h3, came to f4. Now it can come to g6. And uh, all of this without black actually making any progress, because there is no progress to be made. Uh, and this is what uh, fascinates me about this game so much, that when black pushed this pawn from c5 to c4, yes, uh, black said, now your c3 pawn is weak, uh, but it also made a very committal move that, uh, well, it, it's really not able to make any progress. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, a double-edged sword, this c4 move. 
uh, bishop to g5 now and now comes knight to g6 of course alpha does not allow this knight to be traded for the bishop bishop captures on c1 we have queen captures on c1 and now bishop to e6 uh, putting more defense to the d5 pawn and now finally comes knight to e5 so this is one ambitious knight you know traveling all the way from f3 of course it couldn't go from f3 uh, to e5 immediately black would just capture it with the bishop it required this uh, very nice journey g1 h3 f4 g6 and only then after the dark square bishops are traded and now alpha brings the knight over to e5 and now this is this becomes a monster knight uh queen to c7 hopefully now this a5 knight can either be traded for this knight or it will find some use on b3 uh rook to b2 uh, now Alpha's plan is like we said from the beginning black pushed c4 uh, Alpha wants to make d5 a target so Alpha is planning rook to b5 to actually attack it with the rook uh, we have knight back to b7 uh, and now comes rook to b5 as planned knight back to a5 Stockfish simply waits to see uh, what will happen and now comes queen to f4 uh, we have knight to b3 and now comes knight to g6 offering a queen trade and here stockfish is not allowed to trade queens because after knight captures on b4 uh, on f4 there's a triple attack against the d5 pawn and uh, even if you play something like king f7 first the uh, alpha will improve e3 not allow e2 to stay a target and then after any move black makes uh, white will simply start grabbing material captures 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 and uh, with uh, being up a pawn in a better position uh, alpha should win this game so after knight to g6 we have queen to c6 uh, and now comes queen to e5 so slowly but surely alpha improves the position and now you might say okay but what if a6 doesn't that bother this rook it doesn't seem like it's very comfortable there but yeah rook to b4 and there's really no way to further attack this rook you only have a light square bishop and the knight doesn't really have all that many ways to attack the rook if you attack it further rook b5 and again there will be so much pressure against this d5 pawn uh, the knight can come to f4 and then there will be uh, uh, the d5 pawn will be attacked four times so not really possible so after queen to e5 we have queen to d7 simply waiting to see what happens also the d5 pawn is nicely defended uh, we have e3 you know taking care of any any future weaknesses uh, knight back to a5 and now comes bishop to g2 uh, perhaps uh, freeing the square f3 for the knight if needed uh, knight back to b7 and now comes rook to a1 uh, king to h7 and now comes knight to f4 uh, we have bishop to g8 and uh, now comes a move that alpha has been planning it seems like an odd decision here trapping your own queen like that but uh, alpha has everything planned out rook captures on d5 and now you don't have the option of playing rook captures on e5 because rook captures on d7 rook captures and then after pawn captures here uh, the attack against the b7 knight and also this the threat of this pawn coming to e6 is too overwhelming for black to handle uh, even though uh, the material is equal on the board uh, but now after you move the knight let's say knight c5 bishop to h3 comes there is no way to actually defend this as e6 is coming so here you would have to play something like rook d2 but then bishop captures king h8 uh, and now e6 will be uh too, too great to stop even if you capture king g2 king g1 attacks the rook uh rook moves now comes knight g6 check king moves knight here check king moves and now you simply push the pawn the f7 is guarded by the knight so no bishop to f7 is possible uh you are unable to prevent this uh, pawn from queening and uh, the game is over uh, so here after rook captures on d5 you cannot capture the queen uh, you have to play bishop captures on d5 and this is what alpha had in mind uh, queen captures on d5 and again if you capture then bishop captures you're just uh, gonna lose more central pawns uh, so after queen captures on d5 we have knight to d6 but here alpha finds a way to trade queens nevertheless uh, bishop to h3 uh, putting pressure on the f5 pawn rook to e7 now this rook will at some point be able to come to c7 to defend the c4 pawn knight to g6 attacks the rook rook to f7 and now knight to e5 attacks the queen and the rook uh, but stockfish has it all figured out queen to b7 now you cannot capture the rook as your queen on d5 is hanging uh, but alpha never intended to to gain material equality it just wanted to uh you know sacrifice the exchange and have a lot of central pawns uh bishop to g2 and now comes queen captures bishop captures on d5 attacking the rook and now comes rook to c7 so okay the knight and bishop are attacking the c4 pawn but the knight and rook are also defending the c4 pawn so white cannot grab it just yet and now comes king to g2 
uh, we have knight to e4 uh, going after the weak c3 pawn but alpha says no problem bishop captures pawn captures and now comes f3 pawn captures king captures on f3 and now you see where alpha's compensation lies yes stockfish is up the exchange but alpha has a very strong knight and uh the the c3 pawn that's basically uh the weakest uh, link in this pawn chain is guarded by blackstone c4 pawn so now all alpha has to do uh, is push <laughs> uh, push two connected pass pawns so that's uh compensation enough for the exchange uh rook to e7 uh, we have knight to g6 attacking the rook rook to b7 and now comes e4 as of course uh like josh waits can always said pass pawns must be pushed uh we have b5 he captures on b5 rook captures on b5 and now comes knight to f4 uh, protecting the h5 pawn uh rook to b3 and now comes knight to e2 protecting again the c3 pawn now you don't really gain anything by going after the pawn once again because white can always prevent it with e5 so rook to a8 protecting the a7 pawn but now e5 and now stockfish starts pushing its own passed pawn uh we have d5 pushing another passed pawn a4 we have d6 a3 and now comes d7 and now you already have to start dealing with the past d7 pawn king to g8 uh, we have rook to d1 and now comes rook b to b8 uh white simply pushes e6 we have king to e king to f8 preparing king to e7 and if black was uh, will be able to uh, play king e7 such a nice blockading move then perhaps the black will still have drawing chances but alpha doesn't allow it uh, there is one move that ends the game uh, on the spot alpha did play it but uh, you know feel free to pause the video uh, and try to find this move that alpha played uh, i will just uh, have a nice sip of my water here so uh, for those of you who were able to find it congratulations you are really you know uh, in for a wonderful Christmas and for those of you who just want to enjoy the show uh, the move is of course knight to d4 knight to f4 is also possible but uh, then you you just allow black to go to e7 uh, but knight to d4 doesn't allow it because here king to e7 is met with knight to c6 check the, this fork uh, ends the game immediately uh, so on the other hand after knight to d4 which is the move alpha played stockfish resigned in this position rather it failed to make a move in in some reasonable time that it was allowed uh but now after you, any anything you try let's say a2 uh still you get knight to c6 and now comes uh let's say you bring a queen into the game uh it doesn't work because you capture capture and now after captures there's no way to pre prevent queen uh, king e7 knight checks king captures and now uh, there's a queen brought into the game and on the other hand after knight to c6 if you don't start with bringing a queen into the game let's say you try n rook to b1 which seems like an excellent move you know uh yeah sure you bring a queen i'm just gonna grab it with my rook and then i'm gonna queen this pawn it doesn't work because it's actually a forced checkmate in two uh you will simply bring even a rook will suffice uh, this comes with check black has to capture there are no other moves and after captures this rook uh delivers checkmate as the knight and pawn are creating a wall here against the black king as you can see here so this would be checkmate and the game of course would be over but uh stockfish didn't bother after knight to d4 uh stockfish fa uh, failed to make a move and therefore it resigned so uh that's the game i, I do hope you enjoyed it a very nice uh, maneuvering game um quite 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 an enjoyable one, one i hope you agree uh and yeah like i said uh the first thing you will see in below will be uh, a link to your channel feel, feel free to check it out uh and you know do, do subscribe if you if you enjoy it uh i would like to thank uh martin schwea uh, paul hurst peter rose david hell and sam leonard for a contribution to my channel thank you a lot i really appreciate it uh as usual you can check two of my previous videos here thank you all for watching and i will see you soon most likely on christmas i might even have a short stream uh tomorrow morning we'll see how it goes uh but i'll, I'll definitely just uh, you know at least throw a puzzle or or something uh so so you know we have a uh, a nice Christmas video. Uh, but yeah, thank you all, uh, and uh, hopefully I will see you soon. Hello everyone and welcome to a really wild game that comes as a suggestion from a subscriber uh, also from the Tata Steel Masters edition I didn't uh, uh, cover it uh, while it was uh, uh, while it was happening it's Parha Maksudlu versus Arjun Erigaisi uh, I believe it's the penultimate round or maybe the round before that uh, I'm just gonna check I don't want to trick you guys uh, yeah from round 12 so from the penultimate round Maksudlu with the white pieces and um, uh, Arjun Erigaisi with black uh, 
really a wild attacking game that, um, uh, well, uh, one player definitely takes advantage of, uh, but there was a moment during the game where everything could have been prevented. Uh, you guys will uh, help the, the losing side uh, try, try to avert that, but uh, in the game it did not happen. So let's dive straight into it. Uh, Parham with the white pieces opens with d4. We have knight to f6, c4, g6, knight to c3, uh, and d5. Uh, Arjun goes for the Grunfeld defense. We have knight to f3, uh, the three knights variation, bishop to g7, and now uh, many moves are possible here, and many moves uh, have been played here numerous times, like c cap on d5, queen b3, bishop to g5, bishop to f4, uh, all of these very popular e3, like any move you, you play here with white is basically theory, uh, but Parham goes for h3, and it's a very, very rare move uh, that um, almost looks like uh, he's giving up a tempo, uh, but uh, I mean, uh, probably he had something in mind as he, he, he prepared it for this game, it is classical chess. And okay, uh, here Arjun just castles, we have c captures on d5, knight captures and pawn to e4, like you would have uh, against a normal Grunfeld, knight captures on c3, b captures and pawn to c5, so everything absolutely the same, bishop to e2 and now knight to c6, black with the standard pressure on that d4 pawn, and white looking forward to uh, advancing the pawn to d5 at some point, maybe. So bishop to e3, c captures, c captures and queen to a5 with check, and now uh, bishop back to d2, you already see that uh, something very weird is happening here but okay bishop to d2 and now queen to a3 and although white would really want to play d5 uh, it's kind of a problem because the rook is still on a1 uh, but that's exactly what parham uh, prepared for this game he plays rook to sorry not that uh, he plays pawn to d5 uh, and uh, he offers the full uh, the, the exchange on a1 and uh, Arjun does not go for that if you go for this for example bishop captures queen captures your knight is attacked you have to move the knight somewhere you can't uh, go uh, for this the queen covers those squares you have to play something like knight to d8 then uh, Parham uh, controls this diagonal the, the dark square bishop is no more uh, maybe you can open up the h file which would be uh, deadly deadly for black but uh, you don't even have to do that you could just castle and then uh, play uh, with a strong center and with this beautiful control like uh, at some point e5 d6 will create a pass pawn for white you have the bishop pair i mean you're probably gonna put a rook on d1 push that pawn and life is good for white so arjun uh, doesn't want to have uh, anything to do with this he instead moves the knight knight to e5 and now uh, parham castles we have bishop to d7 and now rook to b1 putting pressure on the b7 pawn and bishop to a4 attacks uh, parham's queen on a on d1 queen to e1 and now the question is how do you uh, play this uh, the the position the position has been reached before uh, but uh, uh, it, it uh, uh, went a very very different way here one of the nicer moves you could play is knight captures on f3 and i'm just going to show it for example captures captures and bishop to c2 you attack the rook and it looks like a wonderful idea what's uh, what's happening here with bishop to d3 the rook here is is kind of in a, a bad spot but you're going to play rook to b4 and now okay uh, bishop to d3 for the moment does nothing you can just defend uh, but what you can play is queen captures on a2 or rather what you cannot play because now bishop to c3 and even though uh black did grab another pawn black has the two connected pass pawns on the queen side white will trade off the bishops the dark square bishop uh, will not uh, be uh, you know harassing white any longer and you will play e5 d6 create a pass pawn and uh, your pawn should be much faster than black's queen side pawn so that's the idea uh, arjun doesn't like this he plays knight to d3 instead and it is now as of move 16 that we have a completely new game so bishop captures queen captures and now bishop to g5 parham puts pressure on the e7 pawn and if he can gobble that up then he will have a pass to d pawn so rook f to e8 and now queen to b4 even though rook captures on b7 looks uh, really awesome uh, it's a very tricky line if rook captures Captures on b7, then look at this, bishop b5. And now, how do you prevent queen captures on f1? Uh, bishop captures on e7, and now after queen captures on f1, queen captures, bishop captures, you're gonna play king captures, and okay, you grabbed some material, but look at this uh, beautiful d pawn. Uh, you do not wanna play against that. 
So, okay, after rook uh, f8, we have queen to b4, now putting pressure on the bishop, and pawn to b5. Uh, Arjun plays this very, very gladly. He wants to play a5 next, kick away the queen, then continue pushing his queenside pawns. Uh, rook b to c1, even though you could play bishop capture 77 and create a passed uh, pawn right away, he first goes for rook to c1. He wants activity above all. He wants to put the rook on c7. So, a5 attacks the queen. We have queen to c5, and now queen captures an e4 so he gives up even this beautiful central pawn to play rook f to e1 uh, parham just going for for activity uh and then you know uh everything should uh, sh should be uh, uh well the position should play itself uh but we'll see what happens queen to f5 by arjun and now pawn to g4 attacking the queen once again queen to c8 and now bishop captures on e7 and the passed pawn has been created so what can arjun do of course he can trade queens uh but he starts pushing b4 he says if you want to trade let's trade everything on c8 uh but he doesn't queen back to e3 now d6 is coming so queen to b7 puts pressure on the pawn and pawn to d6. We have rook a to c8 offering a rook trade. Now knight to g5. As the rook is no longer on f8, the f7 square is uh, fairly weak and you could attack it with a move like queen f4. So here rook captures on c1, rook captures and now queen to d5 uh, taking care of... Uh, that uh, f7 weakness uh queen to f4 and now we have queen captures on a2 you could play something in between like maybe h6 kick away the knight uh, but arjun says no need for that queen captures on a2 now he can start pushing his past b pawn uh we have rook to c4 now cutting off the queen's defense of the f7 pawn now queen captures uh, is definitely a threat and the way to play this is to play f6 but it looks it looks ugly i mean not just because you can already start capturing but because you can even play knight and now black is just not in a great spot. Uh, sadly for black, this is black's uh, best hope of defending this position. Uh, queen captures rook is impossible. Just knight captures with check loses the queen. Uh, so you know you have to uh, you have to play something like queen to a1 check and then bring the queen to e5 and hope you survive. Uh, but okay, that was not played in the game. In the game, pawn to f5 was played and this uh, just gives Parham a bit too much. He plays g captures on f5. Pawn to h6 and now just pawn to f6. He is allowing uh, h captures on g5 because he wants to play f7 with check. And okay, it's the only move uh, that Arjun has. h captures on g5, f7 with check, king to h7, and now f captures on e8. Bringing another queen into the game and parting with the queen on f4. So g captures on f4. And here comes queen to f7. And this is a beautiful, beautiful position uh, because... Um, uh, well, for one, uh, you are threatening many things, like uh, you could uh, uh, start advancing your, your pass pawn. Okay, the bishop is co covering this d7, uh, but it's something black will have to worry about for the rest of the game. However, there's the immediate threat of bishop to f6, uh, which will uh, create the threat of unstoppable checkmate. And it's not easy to get out of this. There is one way. And black can survive this, although he has to play a series of very, very precise moves. So feel free to pause the video and try to save this game uh, for Arjun uh, while I give you a couple of seconds. So uh, for those of you who were able to do it, congratulations on spotting this incredible idea. And for those of you who just want to enjoy the show, it is uh, not bishop to e8, what was played in the game, but in fact, it's queen to a1 with check. And now after king to g2, just bishop to b3. That's the, the star move. And it seems like uh, everything is the same, but it's not. You can no longer play bishop to f6. The queen covers that square. Now we will see queen captures on f4, bishop captures on c4, and now queen to h4 check. It looks like uh, it's still going to be impossible to defend, but you have bishop to h6. And now after queen captures on c4, you will play queen to e5. Very important move. You don't allow the white queen to go behind the passed pawn. And also you don't allow d7 because queen captures on e7. So here, look at this, queen d3 now prepares to push the pawn, now bishop to g5, again stopping the advancement, because if you push now, bishop captures, and yes, you can bring a queen into the game, uh, but just bishop captures, queen captures, and b3, and it will be black who will be winning this game. So uh, that's uh, not going to happen. So what you will have to do after bishop to g5 is go queen to g3, 
uh, offer a queen trade and now it doesn't really matter what you play if bishop to f4 you're just going to play queen to f3 and if queen to f5 now you're going to play queen to d1 uh, put the queen behind the pass pawn but now queen d7 you stop the advancement of the pawn and that's pretty much it so uh, that's what you should play and congratulations to everyone who found this uh, unfortunately for, Ar uh, for Arjun he did not find it during the game he played bishop to e8 which is also a fine idea uh, but it loses to a very uh, specific uh, idea that um, uh, Parham had in mind and that is uh, uh, after bishop to e8 queen captures an f4 uh, now the rook is defended uh, and uh, <laughs> Arjun can play b3 but now pawn to d7 and what do you play here? Uh, if you don't capture just d8 queen, uh, so here bishop captures on d7, now uh, no longer black controls the f7 square, queen back to f7, again threatening bishop f6 to go for checkmate. Uh, and even worse, if you play b2, then rook to h4 is mate in one, so you have to uh, be careful. So queen to a1 check, Arjun now plays it, but a few moves too late, we have king to g2, and now... Uh, well, not, not a lot of moves you can play. Uh, he tries bishop captures on h3, which is a fine idea because if you capture on h3, then look at this. R queen to h1 check, king to g3, and black now has a perpetual. If king to f3, queen to h1 check. If you go further, then even b2 is possible. And now it's white who will have to be careful because if bishop to f6 now, you have queen to h6 check, plus you defend checkmate, and after king to e2 or wherever, you bring another queen into the game. And even though a rook to h4 is a possibility it doesn't matter queen to b5 check now with two queens black will have no problems uh, keeping at least a perpetual uh, against the white king uh, but uh, even though this was move 39 uh, parham plays uh, the correct move after bishop captures on h3 he just moves the king king to h2 and now uh, there is simply nothing for arjun uh, that can be done here he played queen to e5 check but now king captures on h3 and now it's very much different queen to f5 with check he offers a queen trade but the result end game is lost for him g uh, queen captures g captures we have rook to c7 and now king to g6 you have to get out of the out of the way otherwise you're just going to lose the bishop and the bishop will be covering the b2 square so king g6 now bishop to a3 and now bishop to e5 attacks the rook but it doesn't matter white is just up a full rook rook to c5 was played bishop to d4 and now rook captures on a5 we have bishop captures on f2 and rook to b5 and he was in this position on move 47 that Arjun Ergesi resigned the game as there is nothing more to be done here. The rook is now behind the pass pawn. It's on a light square. You're just going to capture it. You're up a full rook, of course, completely winning. So crazy, crazy game as one would expect. Um, uh, both Parham and Arjun are very, very creative players. But here after this queen to f7 move, which is uh, pretty crazy. And it even... Uh, it even invites bishop to b3, which uh, we haven't discussed, but now, of course, bishop to f6, as in other variations, just wins the game for white. It doesn't matter that you've uh, basically invited uh, black to, uh, to royal pin you, but uh, it, it doesn't work. So yeah, after queen to f7, he had one chance of, of delivering this check to cover the, the, the dark squares and the bishop on g7, uh, but uh, he missed it. He was already move 35. I imagine he was under time pressure, and uh, he missed it with, with bishop to e8. Uh, but yeah, crazy game. Uh, very nicely done by, by Parham. Uh, he uh, comes up on top and uh, he takes a full point. And he had a great finish to the tournament. He won uh, the, the last three games he played. He won all three. Uh, so very, very impressive stuff by him. Uh, but yeah, that's the game. Hope you guys enjoyed it and that you were able to find this uh, pause the video uh, moment idea. It's not an easy one to spot. Uh, but uh, hopefully uh, you, you you were able to do it. And it uh, you know it not only improved your game, but also your, your day. Uh, so yeah, once again, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Tara Skarpiak, Sasha Widler, uh, Amir Moron, uh, Paul Hinamund, and Edmund Freeman for your contribution to my channel. Thank you a lot. I really appreciate it. As usual, you can check two of my previous videos here. Thank you all for watching, and I will see you soon. Continuing uh, to check up on your wonderful suggestions such as this one and whatever else happens in the chess world. So thank you all. I will see you soon, and have an excellent rest of your day. Hello everyone and welcome to the most awaited game of the round. It is the local hero Anish Giri versus world champion Magnus Carlsen and they both had a, a set of very good three rounds. Uh, Anish uh, uh, defeated Gukesh in that very nice game that uh, we've covered, the beautiful sacrifice of the knight on g5 and Magnus won that uh, very nice positional masterpiece against Vincent Keimer, uh, both of them with two, two additional draws. Uh, now they face each other. Let's check it out. It's quite a game, a beautiful game to enjoy. Uh, let's dive straight into it. So Anish 
niche uh, with the white pieces opens with d4 we have knight to f6 by magnus c4 e6 now knight to f3 going for the anti nimzo uh, and magnus goes for b6 the queen's indian defense still the most popular reply to white's um, knight to f3 uh, we often say that uh, even though uh, alpha zero said that it's really bad for black it's uh, the, the problem is humans are just not able to play on the level of alpha zero uh, and magnus says all right let's let's see what you got against uh, queen's indian defense we have g3 by anish uh the fianchetto variation and the bishop to a6 now we we had this few uh days ago uh where uh of course the c c4 pawn is hanging and b3 was played uh but now anish plays queen to c2 which is a little bit different because not only does it defend the c4 pawn it also controls the e4 square so e4 is now something black should worry about so magnus just plays bishop back to b7 sort of a tempo loss but um uh, this is how the line is played bishop to g2 we have pawn to c5 and now pawn to d5 we have e capture c captures and now knight captures on d5 so magnus wins a pawn here uh but it's a pawn that's uh, not um, uh, easily kept so here anish castles we have bishop to e7 and now rook to d1 just puts pressure on the knight and magnus plays knight to c6 he blunders the knight on d5 uh, i'm only kidding of course if anish would, were to capture the knight then knight before attacks the queen the rook and also the rook is attacked twice so you would lose the exchange here so instead after knight to c6 anish plays queen to f5 it's a very nice active square for the uh, for the queen and it puts pressure uh, on the knight on d5 so here knight back to f6 by magnus we have pawn to e4 preparing to grab more space with e5 and the magnus plays d6 here here g6 is the more popular move just kicking the queen away but magnus goes for d6 and now he invites pawn to e5 we have pawn to e5 by anish uh, and interestingly magnus carlson already played at this exact same position with the white pieces in i believe some 2009 against yannick pelletier um, uh, where magnus won so uh he he knows what he's doing here uh, and there's only one good move here if you if you play something weird you just get destroyed queen to d7 is the only move and you give up the d6 pawn so here queen captures on d7 knight captures on d7 e captures on d6 and now magnus gets this beautiful diagonal for his dark square bishop so here rook to e1 by anish with king to f8 and now knight to c3 and here magnus goes knight to b4 uh, opens up this diagonal that's always an issue for black in the queen's indian defense and also threatens knight the c2 which would win material and there are many ways you can meet knight to b4 you can play rook a to b a rook to b1 you can play rook to d1 you can just uh, play maybe even rook to e2 you can play bishop to g5 uh many many cool ideas here but anish goes for knight to e5 and uh, bishop to g5 is the move that uh, magnus played against um, uh, yannick uh, in the game that he won but here knight to e5 by anish is a new move so now already as of move 18 uh we have a completely new game that's how much theory went into this and as Anish played it uh, obviously he has it prepared now the question is whether Ma uh, Magnus has it also prepared and this is about the time that Magnus started the uh... Uh, started actually thinking so here knight captures on e5 grabbing that you don't have to play this you could play something like rook to d8 just defend the knight but knight captures on e5 is best with bishop captures on b7 now comes rook to d8 and of course rook to d1 not allowing the knight to fork your rooks so magnus goes knight to c4 now puts pressure on the d6 pawn and anish advances it all the way to d7 so it looks a bit weird to allow uh the pawn uh, to, to be on d7 but um uh, this is uh, uh, well if you know your stuff you can win the pawn back but only if you know your stuff magnus goes knight to c2 uh it, it comes with tempo with the rook on a1 so anish has to waste the move and magnus will bring the knight back to d4 we have rook to b1 uh, and now the question is how do you continue this game uh, Magnus played knight to d4 and this uh, is the start of uh, of uh, big problems for Magnus the way you play this is you have to play knight to e5 you just go after the pawn win the pawn and that's pretty much it uh, then uh, you, you you don't no longer have to worry about the past d7 pawn and even if something like bishop to c, uh, c8 is played it's not a problem then you play knight to d4 and of course you still win the d7 pawn however magnus played knight to d4 right away and here uh this is what i always talk about when i show you games and you guys always think that i'm joking around uh but always always in every position check if you have pawn to b4 if pawn to b4 is a possibility you should check it whether you're white or black uh it's a move that 
that uh, simply decides most of the games on every level, even at the absolute highest level like Anish versus Magnus. Uh, and here Anish of course played pawn to b4 and it looks like it does absolutely nothing, but what it does is everything. Now the problem is, okay, you can't capture obviously, but uh, what happens if you, uh, if you, if you, for example, uh, just ignore it, you go knight to e5, let's say you go after the d7 pawn. Well, that's the best uh, thing you can do. For example, b captures on c5, b captures on c5, and now knight to e4. Now the c5 pawn is also weak. By playing b captures on c5, you weaken the, another one of black's pawns. And now you bishop to e7 defending it. Okay, black defended it, now, uh, and now you play. You're gonna capture on d7, now white advances the pawn to a4, and it's still uh, difficult for black to play this. You have to bring the rook into the game, you have to get your king somewhere while white's entire army is already mobilized and ready for action. Uh, but still, knight to e5 is the best way to play this. Magnus missed the real threat behind pawn to b4, and he played rook captures on d7 right away, and now the game is just completely winning for Anish Giri, but you have to figure out what Anish saw with this b4 plan. Feel free to pause the video and win the game for Anish uh, while I give you a couple of seconds. So uh, for those of you who were able to do it, congratulations on spotting this absolute brilliancy. And for those of you who just want to enjoy the show, it is Bishop to D5. Absolutely spectacular. Now uh, what you are doing is you are attacking the knight on C4. And there's uh, no no good square for the knight. Uh, and also you are getting your, your bishop to safety. That's also uh, one, of the, uh, one of the nicer ideas of this bishop to D5 move. Uh, so how do you play this? Uh, well, knight to D6. Knight, uh, other moves uh, don't really help Magnus. Knight to d6 was played. Now look at this. b captures on c5, b captures on c5, and now you could go rook to b8 with check, but you also don't have to. Anish just plays bishop to a3, and now look at Anish's bishop pair. Absolutely uh, spectacular. The rook also can come to b8 with check, so Magnus has to decide how to, how to play this. If you go something like rook to c7 to defend the c5 pawn, then you allow rook to b8 with check, and now you have to block this somehow. If you block with the rook, then uh, again the c uh, five pawn will hang after we trade rooks. So you're gonna have, have to play knight to c8 and now bishop b7 just wins that knight. So uh, you can't go for that. So after bishop to a3, Magnus finds king to e7. It's a very good move. Uh, but now he, uh, he just uh, gives up the c5 pawn. Bishop captures on c5. And it's not like Anish won any material. Anish actually was down material. Now he just regained material. Uh, the problem is that Anish's bishop pair is simply unstoppable here. Uh, Magnus plays knight to e6. He puts pressure on the bishop here, and now Anish goes bishop to b4, and this move allows Magnus to get back into the game. Here, uh, I will just show you a line that uh, completely destroys Magnus, and that is knight to e4. Now, uh, how, how do you how do you play this? There's so much pressure on this knight on d6. Uh, you will play knight captures on c5, but now knight captures on c5. Attacks the rook, and once the rook moves, rook to e1 with check, king to d8, and now knight to a6 attacks the rook. You have to go back, rook to c8, and now bishop captures on f7, and the black king will not be able to survive um, the, the two white rooks, the bishop, the knight here. Uh, this is uh, just unstoppable. Uh, but okay, bishop to b4 was played, it's not uh, easy to calculate everything, and of course you don't want to spend all of your time, because then you're just not going to have enough time, uh, regardless of how winning your position is. Uh, and here, Magnus has a way back into the game, but he misses it. Here he plays pawn to a5. He wants to unpin um, uh, from this nasty pin, and uh, gain a tempo to bring his rook into the game. But the way, you, uh, the, the way you play this is eliminate one of the attackers. Bishop captures on c3, and after bishop captures, now you play knight to f5. And now, uh, after a move like if you try bishop to, f, uh, bishop to b4 check, you can go king f6. If you go bishop to c3 check, you just go king e7. So that's not working for white. So white will have to try something. Okay, white still has the spectacular bishop pair. Uh, but uh, still, after rook captures, rook captures, you will bring your rook uh, into the game. And now, uh, well, whether you can or cannot defend this with black, uh, that's up to how, how good you can hold a passive position. Uh, the bishop pair is still absolutely spectacular. 
whether he would be able to hold this, it is hard to say. But after the move in the game, pawn to a5, now he just gives up a, a pawn for no counterplay. Uh, Anish captures it, we have rook to c8, and now uh, Anish just plays knight to a4. And that's the, the tricky move that Anish had to find. Now it seems like uh, rook to a7 will just attack the bishop and the knight, so what's up with that? It's a very, very tricky line uh, that Anish had to deeply calculate in order to uh, even play this. The point is, look at this, bishop to b4. And now, if you don't capture, then the knight can just come to b6. Uh, and if you capture, then you have bishop captures on d6 with check. And black has the moves. If you capture, then you just play bishop to b7 check, open up a discovery, attack the rook here. After king to c7, you're just rook d to c1, and you will su suffer too much material loss. King will move, rook captures on c8 with check. And now even after king to e7, you even have the flashy rook to e8 check captures, and now you just trade rooks, for example. Bishop captures on a4, and you're, you're down the exchange, but uh, black's down the exchange, but also the past a pawn will be unstoppable. So the problem is after bishop captures on d6, you will have to just move the king, but it's not much better. Rook to b7, and uh, black is without a move here. There's really nothing you can play. You can never move the, the rook from the c file. Bishop to c6 is, is game over. Uh, you can't move the knight because bishop captures an f7. I mean, th there's no move you can play here. So instead, uh, after this knight a4 move, uh, Magnus does not go for rook to a7. He goes for knight to c4, which uh, is even worse uh, than rook to a7 according to the engine. But maybe it gives Anish a few more uh, chances to make an error. And now bishop to b4 check is winning. Uh, but Anish first uh, goes for rook b to c1. It doesn't give Magnus all that many chances. Magnus plays bishop to e5. Uh, Magnus' only chance is Anisha's time, but still Anish has 16 minutes, Magnus has 10 minutes, uh, and the 9 more moves until time control. Uh, 16 minutes uh, seems like way too much time for Anish to finish a position like this. Uh, and here we have bishop to b4 with check. Uh, here, if you try to rush it a little bit, and this was probably Magnus's maybe last hope of survival, uh, if you try to capture on c4, if you go for rook captures on c4, then rook captures on d5. And now it doesn't matter what you play. If rook captures on c8, rook captures on d1 and now maybe rook to a1 and you might have a chance to hold this uh and also after bishop to e5 if you go for something like bishop captures on c4 then rook captures on d1 rook captures and rook captures on c4 again black has some chances of saving this uh but anish says nope now we're just gonna do what was already in the position a move ago bishop to e5 really doesn't change the position all that much bishop to b4 check king to f6 by magnus uh but still knight to c sorry knight to c5 Five. Again, with the same idea. The rook is hanging and the knight on c4 is hanging. So knight captures on c5 has to be played. Rook captures on c4 and now rook d to c7. And now Anish just plays bishop to a5. And he was in this position on move 35 that Magnus Carlsen resigned the game. And what a spectacular victory for Anish Giri, who also takes the lead in the Tata Steel tournament. Uh, I don't know how the other games will end up, but at least a, a, a lead, maybe a shared lead. But for now, after round four, uh, he is in the lead of the Tata Steel tournament. Not only that, he dealt a, 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 a severe loss to Magnus. Magnus Carlsen, as you guys know, uh, he does not lose classical games very often, but uh, well, there you have it. Anish played a spectacular game. Magnus tried everything here. He wanted to play an interesting opening. He played the Queen's Indian defense, uh, which now you see why it's not so easy to play. Uh, doesn't matter if you're up a pawn for the entire game, white always has that activity. Uh, compensation that Alpha Zero could nurture to, to like perfection, uh, but uh, even humans are, are able to do it, as you can see. If you if you give uh, a, a slight uh, chance in the position, uh, but yeah, where did it all go wrong for Magnus? Well, I'm sure I don't even have to tell you. But um, after Rook to B1, of course you know uh, Knight to D4, uh, and if Magnus just checked Pawn to B4, then he would see that everything opens up, that the B file opens up, that the diagonal opens up. He didn't check it and no one is stronger uh you know no one is above checking pawn to b4 if you don't check it you're just gonna lose games so always be careful uh, about that check pawn to b4 whether you're white whether you're black it, it most likely is the the move that will decide the game uh, so yeah, uh, that's the game. Hope you guys uh, enjoyed it. Uh, very nicely done by Anish, who now has excellent chances of winning the tournament, but it's still very early to, uh, to, to say anything. We'll see how the rest of the tournament goes for him. Uh, so I yeah, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I would like to thank Dominic Pintaric, Surich Kota, uh, Dominic Iseli, Jeffrey Manzer, and Richard F. Sayash for a contribution to my channel. Thank you a lot. I really appreciate it. As usual, you can check two of my previous videos here. Thank you all for watching, and I will see you soon. Continuing uh, the coverage of the Tata Steel Challengers and Masters 
uh, until it finishes. Uh, so thank you all. I will see you soon and have an excellent rest of your day. Hello everyone and welcome to the most important uh, tournament of January. It is the Tata Still Masters and we have a wonderful game between Gukesh and Ding Liren. Uh, it's a wonderful tournament, uh, some very very strong players, strong names here like uh, 22800 players, uh, the only 22800 players in the world today, Magnus Carlsen and Ding Liren. Uh, and uh, some uh, very strong upcoming stars like uh, like Gukesh, like Pragnananda, Vincent Keimer, Nodirbek Abdusatorov, uh, Arjun Ergaisi. Uh, they will be uh, doing their best, of course, to try and take a few points uh, from these uh, absolute monsters. And uh, this game is really stunning. Uh, I hope you guys will enjoy it. Uh, let's check it out and then we're going to discuss a little bit uh, about the tournament. So Gukesh with the white pieces opens with uh, pawn to d4. And yes, this is Ding's first tournament after the candidates tournament after after qualifying um, at, uh, to play for the title of world chess champion. Uh, not directly, but as Magnus decided not to play, uh, and Nepo is the actual challenger, Ding was um, a second best in the candidates. Uh, that's why Ding will be playing against Nepo for the title of world chess champion. So let's see uh, how, how he does. D4, we have knight to f6, c4, e6, knight to f3, going for the anti Nimzo Indian. Uh, we have b6, Ding goes for the queen's Indian defense, something that we... I uh, often say that uh, ever since those Alpha Zero games, it seems like Black really shouldn't play this because Alpha Zero just completely obliterated Stockfish when Stockfish played the Queen's Indian. Uh, the problem is uh, yeah, humans aren't able to uh, play these positions quite at the level of Alpha Zero. So it's still okay for humans to go for the Queen's Indian. G3, uh, we have Bishop to Ace, Bishop to B7, uh, still the, the most preferred move, but... Uh, uh, bishop to a6 i think is played at the uh, at the top level so b3 uh, also forces white to deal with the hanging c4 pawn with bishop to b4 with check bishop to d2 and now bishop back to e7 so black plays twice with the dark square bishop but white will also have to do it uh, at some point as you don't really want your bishop on d2 so bishop to g2 we have castles castles and now pawn to d5 by ding this is all very well known theory nothing new here knight to c3 c6 and now bishop to f4 sometimes c captures on d5 is played bishop to f4 4 is the other uh, top move knight b to d7 and now c captures on d5 and here uh some games have reached this position i think five of them in the database from top tier tournaments where c captures on d5 was played and even though the engine says you should play knight captures on d5 no one plays that ever uh e captures on d5 by ding and it is now as of move 11 that we have a completely new game so the difference is now the e file is semi-open for black and uh, the c file is closed uh, usually you would have an open c file and both white and black would put the rooks on the c file but now ding has this backwards c6 pawn and uh, it's very interesting to see what he will do with this and how he will uh, push this game forward so of course uh, um, gukash goes for knight to e1 he wants to put the knight on d3 where he will also have control over e5 but also over the c5 square so rook to e8 we have knight to d3 and now knight to f8 going after the bishop here knight to e6 will force uh, black to either move really back with the bishop uh, or to just uh, trade it so Gukish decides to trade it right away bishop g5 knight to e6 and here we have a trade bishop captures bishop captures now ding has the bishop pair and uh, we'll see if he uh, is able to do something with it we have pawn to e3 opening up this diagonal but it should not be a problem uh, but that that's just it it should not but it kind of is uh, because ding plays the absolutely tricky knight to c5 and uh, he's not sacrificing a piece or anything if you capture the knight uh, on c3 will hang uh, but if you don't capture how are you dealing with the knight on d3 which kind of makes e3 a problem it's not a problem if you play perfect chess but that is easier said than done so you have to capture the knight there's nothing you can do about it the, the, there's no way to add an extra defender to the knight on d3 so d captures on c5 bishop captures on c3 rook to c1 you have to save the rook and now queen to f6 ding the Develops the queen, connects the rooks, and defends his bishop on c3. Queen c2. Uh, you don't have to worry about a move like the uh, b captures on c5 now because the bishop on c3 is hanging. So Ding has to deal with that first. And now Ding plays d4. And now the problem is if you play e captures on d4 and bishop captures, look at Ding's bishop pair now. You do not want to play against this. You can't move the knight because the rook hangs. You can't move the rook. Then you weaken the f2 pawn too much. Uh, if you move the knight, also rook is coming to e2. So it will be incredibly difficult for, for Gukesh to stop this bishop pair. Uh, he plays... Uh, 
uh, instead after d4 of course he plays c captures um, uh, on b6 we have a captures on b6 by ding and now rook f to d1 and now you might expect rook a to c8 to add more support to this c6 pawn uh, but ding just plays rook to d8 he says this will not be uh, an issue and okay e captures on d4 bishop captures on d4 and now what's the idea behind the hanging c6 pawn can gukish capture it uh let's check out queen captures on c6 that loses uh, fairly quickly because now just bishop captures on d3 and it doesn't matter if you trade queens or not if you play queen captures on f6 then just bishop captures on f6 and the bishop is now defended you're down a full piece so what you could play is rook captures on d3 but that also doesn't help because now queen captures on f2 check and you get checkmated rook to d1 rook to d1 check rook captures queen captures and once the bishop blocks uh it will be queen to f1 checkmate so the queen cannot capture on c6 one thing gukish could do is play bishop captures on c6 and it is in fact the strongest move but to voluntarily put your bishop on c6 and run into rook to c8 it just doesn't look like a very human move i will show it because it's a classical game we should show nice lines uh, now the the thing is now you have to find knight to f4 it adds uh, the, uh, additional support to this uh, f2 pawn and you don't have to worry about g5 because knight to h5 will come with an attack on the queen so here you will see something like bishop captures on f2 queen captures on f2 now rook captures on c6 and now knight to d5 white has to play this in order to trade as many pieces as possible now you either trade queens or you don't and then look at this just rook captures on c6 queen captures and queen captures on b6 absolutely spectacular queen to a8 uh, and now knight to e7 check even if rook captures then rook to uh, d8 will win the black queen so you're gonna have to play king to f8 now the knight will move and you have this position let's say uh where the material is uh, almost equal uh gukash would be up up upon uh but i mean it, it's hard to say if you will be able to survive with your king wide in the open like this uh so okay it's a possibility but you really have to you really have to calculate everything so here Gukash goes for knight to f4 first it makes sense you really don't want your f2 pawn hanging all the time uh now ding plays pawn to g5 but now it's a little bit different because now after knight to h5 queen to h6 attacks the knight and now there are all sorts of problems uh the the knight is hanging uh also rook to e2 is coming if rook to e2 lands then the f2 pawn will will uh, uh be uh, just weak so here bishop to f3 uh, the only good move for uh, Gukesh defending the knight also guarding that e2 square but now pawn to c5 and this is how Ding solves the problem of the of the uh, of the c6 pawn it took him a while uh, some 25 moves but now once it's on c5 look at this the bishop and pawn here uh, really uh, control the two rooks and the two rooks really have no business being on c1 and d1 as long as ding has this pawn on c5 and bishop on d4 here gukash plays g4 uh, okay now the knight is defended you don't have to worry about that so you can move the bishop but now ding has an absolutely spectacular move uh which you guys are welcome to try and find uh feel free to pause the video and try to find this idea uh while i give you a couple of seconds So uh, for those of you who were able to do it, congratulations on uh, always trying to open new lines uh, for attack uh, on your opponent's king. And for those of you who just want to enjoy the show, it is pawn to f5. Such a such a brutal move to see on the board. Ding, of course, played it. And now the problem is you can't really capture this. Look at this. If if queen captures on f5, then there's bishop to c8. And now where do you where do you move the queen? Uh, you uh, you can't really go anywhere. You can play c2 or b1. Let's say queen to c2, but but now Ding has the semi-open f file as well. He's just going to play rook to f8, attack the bishop, and then the f2 pawn will become weak. Uh, then he's going to pile up on that f file. Uh, rook's coming to f7 with more pressure. Then the queen will come to help, and uh, you will not be able to, to withstand this. So after f5, Gukash plays knight to g3. He goes after the f5 pawn this way. But now Ding just plays f captures on g4. And now the problem is, if you capture with the bishop, then Ding shifts the bishop to this diagonal. And now once you say goodbye to this diagonal, diagonal 
well, I mean, if you just look at the lines, black is controlling, you, you don't even have to calculate this position. So this is, I mean, too scary to even look at. So after this F captures on G4, we have knight to F5 going after the queen and the bishop here, uh, but now queen to F6. And it seems like Gukesh could capture on D4 and maybe alleviate the pressure a little bit. Uh, but if knight captures on D4, then G captures on F3. And again, you have uh, problems that cannot be solved. How are you stopping checkmate here? You can play queen to f5. Okay, this offers a queen trade, but now rook d6. And after queen captures, rook captures, the f3 pawn is still defended. Let's say knight to c2. You're going to play something like rook e4, then advance the pawns, and then the king. And then it will be, again, the, the bishop is much stronger than knight. Uh, you're up a pawn. Ding would, uh, would win this position. So after queen f6, bishop to e4. A very strong move by Gukesh, uh, putting pressure on the h7 pawn as well. Uh, Ding plays h5. Of course, he needs to advance those pawns to attack the... Uh, the the black king because uh, the white king because with these bishops here once h4 and g3 lands that's it you will not be able to play f captures on g3 you don't you don't have to calculate uh, to, to see that this is crushing so Gukesh finds the absolute best move he plays pawn to b4 uh, as it often is the the absolute best move uh, king f8 by ding uh, he wants to get the king away from any and all checks like he wants to get away from th uh, this check he wants to get away from this check he wants to get away from potential knight checks so king to f8 uh, eliminates uh, any check that white had in mind in the foreseeable future and now uh gukesh has a chance to maybe maybe defend this position but uh yeah it, it would be silly to even ask you to find the move here uh, so i'm not gonna i'm just gonna show you show you what uh gukesh, gukesh played a3 here and it's almost uh, the correct move he he has to play a4 here but it's uh impossible to understand why the point is, uh, after Ding continues with h4, now you can play b5. That's the point. And now, okay, you can't go here. The bishop controls b7. You have to play bishop here. Now, knight captures on d4. c captures and pawn to a5. Look at this. Now you are threatening a6, a7. So, b captures on a5. Now, pawn to b6. You sacrifice this pawn as well. Otherwise, b7 is coming. And after queen captures on b6, there's bishop c6. Blocking the black queen from uh, helping out with the defense. Queen is coming to f, uh, not to f5, but you can bring the uh, queen anywhere you want, and then uh, you, you will at least have some sort of a perpetual, uh, maybe even checkmate to show you uh, how how maybe this could play out. Let's say d3. Okay, you have to find some wizard moves here. Queen to c3 goes after the black king. Rook to e6 now also stops the queen to f6, and now queen to h8 with check. King f7, queen to h7, check, king f6, bishop to e4. Now, again, with all sorts of nasty ideas like rook c7, rook g, uh, queen g7, checkmate. So d2, rook to c7, now threatening checkmate, and now bishop d7 blocking. And it's a I mean, look at this position. Uh, it, it seems like uh, anything is possible, but uh, White would actually have to settle for a perpetual here with King e7 and Queen g7 check. King e8, Queen g8, uh, and now we will have a nice perpetual here. So absolutely crazy stuff here. I mean, the, the, it's impossible that it would play out this way, but I, I just want to show you what... Uh, the position uh, hides so all the, the secrets that are that are hidden in the position. But okay, Gukash played a3, and the problem is this does not come with any threat. And now Ding is free to play h4, and now g3 is pretty much unstoppable. Rook to e1, uh, Gukash uh, is what Gukash played. And now feel free to pause the video and uh, find the the finishing blow for Ding uh, while I give you a couple of seconds. So uh, for those of you who were able to do it, congratulations on always finding incredible ways of breaking through uh, your opponent's defenses. And for those of you who just want to enjoy the show, it is Rook captures on E4. Uh, uh, now, <laughs> and now once you see what uh, what Gukesh played, now you will realize why Rook captures on E4 is so powerful. Uh, Gukesh played Queen captures on E4, but let's discuss Rook captures on E4. It seems also possible because now if Queen captures Rook, you can just deliver a check and pick up the Black Queen. Uh, the problem is there's Bishop to D3. Look at this spectacular idea by Ding, and now you really don't have a move. Uh, once you play Queen captures on D3, just Bishop captures on F2, and now it's White actually who loses the Queen. King captures, Rook captures, and you cannot defend the Knight, so you will lose the Knight as well. Uh, so it's Queen and Rook against Rook and Rook of, uh, completely crushing. So Gukesh played Queen captures on E4 instead, but that does not save him from Ding's idea. Bishop to D3 works once again, uh, and now Queen to E6. Okay, you offer a Queen trade. 
but now Ding is very happy as he will have the mighty bishop pair for a rook. So queen captures on e6, rook captures, and now just bishop captures on f5. Absolutely incredible. Now the two bishops will fight uh, against the rook, and uh, well, you, you just can't save this. Rook captures on b6 is played. This does create a pass pawn for, for Gukesh, but Ding just goes uh, for the kill pawn to g3 h captures h captures you cannot save this uh, uh b captures and c5 was played but now just bishop to h3 and it was in this position on move 39 uh before reaching time control that gukesh resigned the game uh, as there is nothing more to be done here let me just check uh, i don't want to trick you guys maybe he uh, uh i mean it's uh not very likely but maybe he did lose on time no, no okay he he still had two minutes on the clock uh, when the game ended uh, i thought maybe because it's a move 39 maybe because they didn't reach time control that he maybe lost on time but no uh, he he just resigned here the problem is uh black can just move pieces like you, you, like a cat could move pieces for black and you would still win this because e every move wins let's say rook to c2 you want to add a defender now rook e8 threatening checkmate uh, and now after rook to b1, uh, defending checkmate, you could just play g4. This is very important because you have to play g captures on f2 and then uh, attack, the, attack the pinned piece once again. And now after, let's say, c6, you're going to play king to g7, you're going to play c7, g captures on f2, check, rook captures, and now you will attack the pinned rook uh, once again. King h2, g captures on f2, and that's it. Nothing more to be done here. a4, you're going to play rook to e1 with check, and of course now uh, the white king will get checkmated. King h2, bishop to e5 with check, king captures on h3, and queen to g3, one of the possible continuations, but uh, like I said, any, anything wins here for black, uh, and of course uh, that's why Gukesh resigned. Uh, so there you have it. If you were wondering uh, if Ding is ready for the World Chess Championship match, uh, uh, well, uh, if, if we consider what happened in round one against a, a spectacular player like Gukesh with the white pieces, uh, I would say that Ding is ready, but still. Uh, World Chess Championship is a different story and Nepo is a different kind of beast. Uh, we'll see we'll, we'll see what happens there. Uh, for now, we are focusing on the Tata still. Incredible game by both of them, but uh, it seems that uh, Ding uh, absolutely outprepared Gukash. This E capture some D5 move that was never played before uh, obviously proved too much for, for Gukash. And even though he defended well uh, already when Ding, uh, just a few moves later, Ding found this Knight to, e5, knight to C5 move, which uh, won him the Bishop pair, and uh, it was just just uh, uh he, he already had the bishop pair but it made the bishop pair more powerful so i mean a absolutely incredible game a masterpiece if you will uh so yeah that's the game hope you guys enjoyed it first game that we've covered from the masters hope more games are, are uh, <laughs> this, this incredible uh we'll see what happens uh, i would like to thank uh, randomfile.net jimbo robert kiefer duitran and ravishing reptiles youtube for a contribution to my channel thank you a lot i really appreciate it as usual you can check two of my previous videos here thank you all for watching and i will see you soon uh continuing the coverage of the tata still uh, masters and uh, challengers uh, until it finishes uh, so thank you all i will see you soon and have an excellent rest of your day